Good morning, commissioners. District one. Here. District two. District two. District three. District four. District five. Present. Did. District six. Present. District seven. District seven. District eight. Here. District nine. Here. District ten. Present. District 11. District 11. District 12. District 12. District 13. District 14. And place 15. I'm here. You have quorum, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Piscina. We do have a quorum. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024 at 9.05 a.m. Welcome to a special workshop for the Dallas City Plan Commission. We're going to uh, discuss the update to Forward Dallas, and we're going to just go ahead and jump right in. And uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Handing it off to you. All right, cool deal. All right, thank you for your patience. Uh, good morning, uh, CPC. So as we begin today's discussion, um, just wanted to say again, thank you all for just all the work that you've put um, behind the scenes uh, with our team as well. So we're gonna be diving straight into this, nine to two o'clock. Um, we're gonna have a few, let me talk to you. Uh, we're gonna have a, a discussion at the beginning from staff, just giving a quick overview uh, related to the project, uh, some data points that we wanna uh, reiterate and talk about and also clarify some um, some inf information that uh, we're hearing from the community and just to clarify what the project is about. Uh, we're going to delve into the community residential uh, discussion. Uh, we will facilitate that conversation first with some slides on the presentation and then we'll delve into the, the report, uh, the document, excuse me. Uh, plan to have a lunch around 1130, 12-ish. Uh, come back and have a working lunch where we will discuss the implementation section of the plan, uh, other updates of the document, and then talk about scheduling and next steps. So just to provide an overview of what we talked about so far, uh, we've gone through most of all the place type descriptions. We've gotten the feedback from you all uh, related to that. We've also touched on the place type map and some issue areas that uh, our team wanted to clarify. So for today, we're gonna to focus again, like I mentioned, on the community residential discussion. Uh, then we're gonna move our conversation to the implementation section. And then we have a few updates uh, related to other, other components of the plan document um, as we continue to update this for the next iteration. So as we gonna continue doing for the foreseeable future, clarifying what Ford Dallas is and isn't, we're still getting and hearing um, information from just outside sources about what it isn't. Uh, so we want to just clarify uh, what it is. Uh, so first of all, this is not a zoning document. 
Um, this is a visioning document meant to guide and provide the ideal representation of what the city wants to look like from a development and future land use perspective. Um, zoning is a different process and it uses it uses Forward Dallas as a guide in terms of what needs to happen. So I want to make sure that it's being very clear that Forward Dallas is not zoning. Um, it's a different, entirely different process. Uh, but zoning does use Forward Dallas as a guide in terms of uh, what should happen on the ground. Uh, two, Forward Dallas does not call for the elimination of single family zoning. Again, zoning is a separate, entirely different process. Uh, within Fort Dallas, any suggestions about uh, density form uh, within single family communities and other communities uh, should be designed and be to scale. But again, the zoning component, the code is what enforces, what develops, and what um, provides that detail in terms of what that needs to look like. And that's an entirely different process that happens outside of Fort Dallas. Fort Dallas <clears throat> does not call for the reduction of lot sizes. Um, again, zoning and code updates are an entirely different process outside of the purview of Fort Dallas. Um, so the, the call for Fort Dallas doesn't even have that language in there. It is not to, to, to talk about the reduction of, of lot sizes. That's an entirely different process that happens outside Fort Dallas. Uh, Fort Dallas does not recommend that developers be able to develop multiplexes on all vacant lots. Uh, again, another thing that we heard from the community that just Fort Dallas does not include, so we just want to be very explicit um, in terms of what Fort Dallas is recommending and not recommending. Uh, Fort Dallas does not uh, change nor make recommendations to change the zoning uh, for any historic district, any conservation district, or any single family parcel. Again, uh, in terms of what Fort Dallas is doing, is providing a general guidance for the city. Um, all those um, more regulatory components happens in the zoning and code side of things, and that's an entirely different purview from what Fort Dallas is looking to do. And I think that might be the last knot. Uh, Fort Dallas does not remove, modify, or recommend eliminating our parking uh, regulations. Uh, that is another um, project that's happening outside of Fort Dallas in terms of talking through park, uh, parking reform and what that looks like, but that is not part of what Fort Dallas uh, is recommending or suggesting. All right, so um, next section we want to talk about, as we've heard from you all over the last few uh, workshops and discussions, that you would like for our team to provide you with data just to support the information, just to support the, the recommendations and the plan that we've been developing over the last several years. Uh, so we mentioned that you know, we have an existing conditions report. Um, we referenced that a few times, but what we want to do is kind of bring some of those uh, data points uh, to, the, to the fore with you all just to kind of talk through uh, what we are hearing, what we're seeing um, as planning professionals and what we're also hearing from the community. So a few kind of data points that we want to just highlight um, as we continue to develop this plan. Um, one, in terms of our fiscal analysis, um, some of you all might be familiar with some of the work that um, Urban 3 did when they came to the city uh, early, early in January. They provided a uh, fiscal analysis from a land use perspective uh, in terms of how different types of land uses, how efficient they are for the city's tax base. Uh, so this is a quick um, overview in terms of some of the takeaways. So when we got that information from Urban 3, uh, we have an actual data analytics team in the department that actually used um, that baseline um, way of understanding the city and they developed their own model in-house. So from that model, we'll, we'll delve into that a few, a few slides uh, after this. They were able to unpack a few more takeaways for our team to use, and we'll, we'll explain what that means. So the first component we're going to look at is fiscal, fiscal analysis. Uh, the second part is going to look at housing data and why we're looking to um, either how we're thinking about using land use to help with the housing affordability piece and environmental justice, another major component in terms of what Forward Dallas is looking to do. So I want to delve in each of these pretty quickly just to kind of give an overview of why Forward Dallas is pretty important 
and what we're looking to do from a land use perspective. Uh, so item one, the fiscal analysis piece. Again, like I mentioned, um, based on the urban three model that uh, was provided and developed um, from that consultant group, our data analytics and business intelligence office, they did a deep dive. They actually replicated that, that data based on DCAD data and other uh, county sources and started to look at each land use and each parcel uh, for our department to use for Fort Dallas. So based on that analysis, uh, 36, 35 percent of the city's land, which is devoted to just single family attached um, parcels, has an average tax value. Of, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, detached, uh, I think that's what I was saying. D detached has an average tax value of $1 million per acre, while mixed use properties, which is actually the, the least amount of city land area at 0.2%, uh, has an average um, land area of 11.1 million per acre. So as we look at just the different types of land uses that exist in the city, this is another graphic that shows on one side on the top bar, on the top chart, uh, the single family taking up the majority of the land use or land area in the city. And then the, on the polar opposite of that particular chart, you see mixed use at point two. So when we look at just from a tax fiscal component of how each type of land use is utilized in the city, um, single family detached um, only generates $1 million, $1 million per acre. But on the other side, mixed use land uses generates 11.1 million uh, per acre. Just to kind of look at from this one perspective of fiscal analysis from the city's tax generation perspective, just how efficient these land uses are. Uh, secondly, though, as we look at the next land use on the bottom chart, um, in terms of just average tax density, you'll notice that single family attached is actually the, the second most, in terms of efficiency, uh, second most efficient um, land use in the city. So although that comprises 2% of the land area in the city, that on average it, it's um, 4.1 million in terms of its tax density. So as we, we're looking at it from the fiscal, the environmental, different com components, um, we're starting to understand that different types of land uses have different uh, efficiencies from a tax component, tax side of things. And we just wanted just to highlight that for you all pretty quickly. Oh, do you have any questions? You want to take questions now? Oh, or after this slide, we can jump into questions. Okay, perfect. And then this is the, the, the one slide I wanted to kind of hang on is, <clears throat> so this shows just the residential properties in the city. So we broke it down, or our data analytics team broke it down into single family detached, multifamily, and single family attached. So when we look at just the residential properties in the city, uh, single family attached, like I mentioned, that's $1 million per acre. Uh, multifamily, it's, it's, when we're looking at condos, apartments, that's the next, I guess, most efficient in terms of area-wise at 3.5 million. And then single-family detached, which we're looking at townhomes and duplexes, um, that's the most efficient in terms of $4.1 million per acre. So again, just looking at it from a fiscal tax perspective, um, that's kind of a, a major takeaway that we're looking at in terms of in terms of the land uses that exist in the city and how each of those land uses generate income and generate um, um, kind of fiscal dollars for the city to be able to fund and, and pay for the services that we provide the city. So with that, I'll kind of hang uh, for any questions that you all might have regarding the analysis and any questions specifically to the data that, were, that was developed, we will also move that and provide that to our data analytics department uh, to get a response to you all after this meeting. Thank you, sir. Before we go to questions, I'd just like to recognize and welcome Commissioner Epler to the Horseshoe. Uh, welcome, sir. We all look forward to working with you. Uh, he is the D11 commissioner, so he's my home commissioner. Uh, we look forward to working with you, sir. There's a little button there. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> welcome. Uh, commissioner Hall. I, I thought there was a Lower age limit for this position. <laughs> um, I, I just want a, a better definition of single family attached versus detached. Yes, yeah, so the, those who didn't hear, that, just a better definition of single family attached versus single family detached. So single family, in, in this definition, all single family that's one 
unit, one single family unit, on one parcel, that's single family uh, detached. Uh, everything else re regarding townhomes, duplexes, um, and I'm not sure if there's, if there's others in terms of that definition. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> single family detached is pretty simple. It's a house on one lot that's not attached to anything else. Uh, single family attached um, could be a duplex, it could be a triplex, it could be a fourplex, as long as those units are on their own plotted property, but they share a common wall. Um, that can also be townhomes, um, either the townhomes that we think of um, here in the East Quarter, where you know they, they all have front doors that face the street, or uh, sometimes what's referred to as the, the canyon townhomes, where you have um, you know, there's four, five, or six, and you know they don't all face the street, and they have a, a shared access down the middle. Um, so as long as they um, sit on their own individual lot, um, and they just share a wall. It could be one wall, as in a duplex. It could be a couple of walls together. That could be the townhomes, um, or you know, a triplex or something like that. But those would be single family attached. And uh, we heard the term uh, last week or something about a pocket neighborhood, a pocket houses clustered around a common yard, are those detached? So it's, it's, it's a, <clears throat> so this gets a little bit into development services, but it's a little bit about <clears throat> how that product is developed. Um, and some of our developers can also chime in, but sometimes you have one big property, let's say it's uh, four acres and you have eight units on it. That would, if it's all one property, it would be considered um, an apartment or a condo, um, a, a multifamily, so it would fall here in the middle category. If you had that four acre property and you subdivided it into eight individual lots, but they all you know, have that cottage court feel, that would then be, um, technically that would be single family detached. So it's a little bit about how they subdivide the property up. Um, but again, it's uh, you know, one lot, one house that's not attached, single family detached. Uh, one lot, one house that is attached, single family attached, one lot more than three units on it, that's gonna be the multifamily, the apartments, the, uh, the townhomes, the condos. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair Rubin. Yeah, and you brought up cottage courts, which I know are a, sort of a hot topic these days, and they, they spurred a lot of interest. Are there many of those existing in the city of Dallas today, and are they easy to develop under our current code? Um, I am not aware of many. Um, I'm, I, I know there was one in Old East Dallas on Columbia and Munger, I believe. Um, I believe there are others in the city of Dallas, but um, there are not very many. Um, and again, to uh, your point, um, it's because our current development code makes it difficult to develop that type of housing product. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Chernoff. So I have a question about the data. The, the, uh, and I'm, I'm familiar with Form 3. I've read a little bit of the data they provided for Dallas, and I've actually followed their work in other municipalities, other parts of the city. And it seems like th their data reveals the same thing in every single city. And I, I do want to make sure that I understand it. The single family what they're saying is that the tax revenue generated from a single family property does not support, doesn't create enough revenue to support itself. Meaning service for streets, city infrastructure, sanitation sewer, all of that work and repair. So in an essence, higher density um, zoning subsidizes single family. Correct, that is their takeaway. Yeah, and a, a little bit of it is when you get into like big picture city planning, um, a lot of southern and sun belt cities um, since the 1950s have operated on kind of a perpetual growth model to uh, sustain their cities, as in they could always annex additional property and turn cornfields and horse farms and moon ranches into more housing, um, into more development, and so that's how they were able to sustain themselves. Um, but you know, Urban 3 and other uh, consultant agencies and you know, folks have, have looked at that and said, okay, once you become more landlocked, you can't grow your tax base because you have no additional property to annex and grow your tax base. And so that's where they've done the research to say, if you're gonna grow your tax base and provide those services and roads and streets and everything, you need to, because you can't grow out anymore, you have to look at ways to grow up um, efficiently. Right, and also what they mentioned too is, if you do stay in that particular uh, I guess land development pattern. You could do that, but you just have to tax the residential component more. 
So it, it's possible, but then there are other cities that just have higher taxes to help support um, those other services in the city. So it's my understanding that when, so what you were describing was basically a urban sprawl development type. And when those are being created, the private infrastructure like the sidewalks and the city streets are actually developed by the developer and paid for by the developer. But then the, the municipality inherits the upkeep of that. So fast forward 25 years when that's starting to need s serious work, now the residential um, properties that front those streets don't generate enough revenue to pay for it. So I understand that correctly, right? Yes, that's correct. And, and a lot of um, Urban 3 and other work um, sometimes focuses on inner ring suburbs. So like the city, uh, the suburb of Richardson, they're experiencing the same thing because they have nowhere else to grow. Um, yeah. You know, Garland the same way um, where, you know, developers built roads and streets and water lines and built that infrastructure for the new developments. Well, now you don't have those new developments. And so how do you maintain that? Um, how do you replace those roads, those streets, those sidewalks when you have no new growth happening um, in newly annexed areas of the city? So if that's, if that's the diagnosis that they come up with, that is pretty much the pattern that they see in every city that they study, what's the prognosis? I mean, what is the cure for this? Obviously, we're not going to just, you know, destroy our single family neighborhoods, but what do you do now? Right, so in terms of going back to this slide, that's a great question. So when we look at, for example, single family detached, single family attached, um, we, some, some of those single family attached products can look on the outside uh, side of their facade like a single family detached product, but still generate that type of tax uh, revenue for the city while still providing that, uh, uh, that community the same type of feel that they're used to. So when we look at the, the outputs from these type of residential units, uh, what they suggest is looking at that, the middle housing, the other types of townhomes, duplexes that can assist with providing that generation from a tax revenue perspective while still maintaining the integrity of a community. So, um, so I, you know, I see the data here. I see 1 million per mile, I see 3.5. Obviously, there's a whole lot of gray in between. Do they have any data that says when you cross this threshold, you're now in the realm of being able to, to support yourself uh, in your neighborhood based on the density? Is it like 1.5 million? Is it 1.8 or, you know? That's a good question. I think I, I don't know that data because I actually thought about that question. I think each city has different tax structure and different makeup, but that's that's a question that we can e either ask our data analytics department because I think they're, they're very interested in terms of trying to figure out how can we use this data to help support future development and how the city thinks about where and how development does it look like. So that's a question that's, that's a really good one and we can uh, provide that to our data analytics department. Yeah, I think that's important because I mean, what what, what would help me be able to make intelligent decisions is to really hone down on a game plan here to say, look, you know, I see this data and it's it's eye opening and it's it's helpful. But then it's like, OK, well, what do we do from here? And then what's the game plan? And, and really, what is our goal? Are we trying to get to one point eight million uh, tax revenue per acre so we can start balancing? The ship here or or is it you know whatever it is so if that's that's really what you know this data is helpful it certainly is eye-opening it certainly shapes my thinking but I, th I think we need it more specific and more honed in yeah and to really know what we're trying to do here you know there's the <clears throat> other side of that equation because we say okay once you hit 1.8 or 2.3 you know what is that level of service you know, the, the amount of streets you're repairing, you know, the sidewalks you're repairing, the water lines that you're doing, um, the social services, the libraries that you're providing, you know, you have to figure out that side of the equation as well to help determine, okay, what is that point? Oh, it's I mean, complex. That's a, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bigger complex, question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But it is a good question that we should all be asking. I have one quick follow-up before we get to Commissioner Carpenter's question. So uh, is it fair to say that really what we're talking about is uh, the, the future financial health of the city, how we decide to grow out? Uh, we're talking about income side of the balance sheet for the city of Dallas. 
Uh, and on an interesting note, uh, you know, we, we just went through the, the bond process, the 2024 bond, and um, I guess I had too much time on my hand uh, one evening, and I actually did the math. You know, the, the street on my home needs to be repaired. It's in pretty bad shape, but unfortunately, it didn't meet the needs inventory. Uh, so, you know, I, I actually did the math on the portion of our property taxes that go to the city of Dallas. Uh, I don't think we'll ever be able to repay a bond to fix our street. And eventually our street will be fixed. So the question that I find here, an interesting one, is where is that revenue, that income side of the balance sheet, going to be created to fix my street? And I think to Commissioner Sharnock's point, it's either going to be a, a mixed use or just new development. Uh, and so when we think of the next 30 years, right, at 183 years, the city of Dallas is kind of a toddler. When we think of the next 100 years, you know, what kind of position do we want to take in terms of, you know, financial responsibility and how we want to grow? And I think that's what these, these slides here are kind of putting us on notice here that we, we better pay attention. No, 100%. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Carpenter. Yes, uh, looking at page 12, because I, I got fixated on the information there, um, there's a data point on fiscal analysis and one on housing, and they seem to be, I, I want to talk about the connection between those two goals, because if under fiscal analysis, you know, if the implication is, is that the city really needs to look at more mixed-use development to maximize the amount of tax revenue that a single acre is producing. Okay, you know, we see that on a regular basis. There are recommendations to add density, even whether it's however thoughtfully or context-sensitively to, you know, existing neighborhoods or commercial corridors or transit-oriented development, whatever. I haven't seen a single, when you, when you jump over to housing, it says we need 83,000 dwelling units for households making below 50% of AMI. I haven't seen a, I, I don't remember a single unit that we've created that's, I mean, even subsidized for many people below 50%. So, you know, while I, I see that we need more, I mean, I totally get the fiscal analysis part of it, but, you know, we have the, the kind of the underlying theme has been if we add more density, somehow that gets us to the housing count we, we need. But what is the plan for for getting these units at that income level? Now, that's a great question. I think <clears throat> density is only one component of the affordability kind of question and, and issue that we have in the city. So I think as we go through the rest of the slides and we kind of talk through um, kind of the different aspects. So you, you can look at density. You can you can look at um, regulations. So there's, there's there are cities that have a maybe a ton of regulations, and that adds to uh, on affordability piece, uh, there, there, there's a plethora of different ways that we're looking at it, but I think from our perspective, from land use, what can we do from a land use perspective in terms of um, how the different parcels in the city are, are you know, divided, the, the uses, that's kind of what our, our specialty is in terms of housing specifically with other uh, incentives and other aspects, that's kind of outside of our purview, but that's a great question too that I think we can probably provide a follow-up uh, as we talk with our housing department in terms of what additional components can, can we think about that could help with the affordability piece. Yeah, it's, um, if you're familiar with uh, the, 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 the concept of filtering in the housing market, um, it's, it's a complex <clears throat> understanding, but basically let's say you have one property that is affordable right now. Um, when we don't increase density citywide, eventually that property is going to go up and like the, the cost of living in that structure is going to go up or the private market will eventually find that property and redevelop it and that redevelopment will, be, will not be affordable. If you create opportunities for additional housing, you, you, you can affect the price of that property or the rents for that property because you've increased density over you know, other areas or if you, and or if you've created opportunity for the private market to go develop elsewhere, then the private market may not develop that one property and therefore that property remains more affordable because the private market has gone and made other properties and you know, they've created an economic benefit for themselves to develop other areas, that's where the money went, that's where the private market went, 
creating additional housing that might end up looking like it's luxury housing, but that other property, the initial property, then remains more affordable because the market's gone somewhere else. Commissioner Turner. I, uh, I, I read a statistic, and I just don't recall where it was, and I, I'm maybe thinking that you might know, and it sounded like exactly what you were just explaining, but the statistic was for every 100 market rate units, 70, addition, 70 existing units are pushed down in the price ladder. It doesn't push them all the way. Well, in a sense, the bottom of the bottom pushes down into the afford affordable. But there is the point was is that there is some relationship with new infrastructure at market rate creating more affordable units of existing units in the market. Yes, that um, you're going to have some units, like you said, um, you know, if you take 100 units right now that are, are affordable and you put another 100 units somewhere else that are, are, are luxury units, there's an effect on that original 100 units. Some of those will still become not affordable, but because you created the luxury units over here, there's a filtering effect where some of those original units that are not, you know, are not affected by new development over there, the price of those units are affected. Um, and we can follow up because um, it's taken me a long time to get to that understanding because it's a complicated and it, it's sometimes counterintuitive when you're like, well, these high-end new townhomes that are built, how does that make, you know, people see that and they say, okay, that's not affordable housing, but building those new townhomes that are not affordable has an effect on the overall market where those units went over there, so there were existing units, and some of those existing units then remain affordable because you've created luxury opportunities at a different location. Uh, uh, I also want to say I actually uh, really appreciate Commissioner Carpenter's comments. You know, when you look at this stuff, be, being somebody who has built structures, it's daunting. I mean, it seems overwhelming. When you really kind of hone down, you really start peeling this back and looking at this, you're like, how are we going to get there. Um, and so I thought those those comments were on point. You know, I, the way I kind of resolve that for myself is, is a little bit what you said. It's just there's only so much we can do, but we're here to actually make land use decisions. So let's make the ones that give us the highest probability of success and then all of the other market conditions that we can't control, like cost of labor and cost of materials. Um, hopefully those will shift over time. Uh, the other thing I, I think about a little bit too is, you know, uh, looking at some of the other monikers like the, the median multiple. Um, when you actually look at this, how this stuff trends over time, you know, just about 11 years ago, Dallas was an affordable city if you look at the median multiple index. And I think we're going to look at, the, I think you might have some slides on that a little coming up. And then you look at every year since then, that has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and we're now in a, uh, an unaffordable, severely unaffordable, trending towards severely unaffordable city. So it's like when we are looking today and we're like, uh, how do we get out of here? Uh, we got into this kind of mess over a decade's process. We're not going to really get out of this for a decade, but we need to plant the seeds now so it bears fruit later. And when we're doing these land use planning, I mean, we're really thinking in chunks of 20 years. And that's really how we need to orient our thinking, which is very different than what we do every session here when we're really honing down into the, you know, individual cases. When, when we're doing this kind of exercise, this is just a macro exercise that should be driven by data and, and looking at large blocks of time. So, um, and that's all I have to say. No, 100%. hundred percent. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Oh, go ahead. Just one yeah. brief follow-up. Um, excellent point by Commissioner Carpenter. I think, you know, we, we struggle here with the MIHDB program. It's, it's difficult to get folks into the lower AMI uh, brackets, uh, but, and I know that, you know, you guys aren't from the housing department, uh, but some of the, we do get some of the light tech projects. And uh, as you know, we're, you know, Litex is a financing mechanism which we're agnostic to. We're, we're blind to that, but occasionally we do know which, which kind of projects they are, and we do see them. And uh, I know we, we had one uh, in D11 maybe three years ago, uh, and we see them a lot in, in South Dallas. 
Uh, that's a whole other issue. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious if you, you guys have any, uh, any knowledge about those and how, how deep those get into those income brackets. Um, I think once we get into the implementation discussion, because we do have um, uh, implementation um, action items in the housing uh, part about talking about housing affordability, um, talking about working with the housing department, um, talking about you know, many of the things you referenced, whether it's a LIHTC project or um, just how they're doing their NOFAs and that type of stuff. So once we get into the implementation um, section, I think we can go over some of those details. Perfect. Commissioner Blair? I'm, you opened the door, so I'm going to walk through <laughs> with my boots on. Um, when you're looking at uh, the affordability and you're looking at, and, and, and the discussion has been about cost, um, how single family homes don't generate the, the enough revenue in order to maintain itself, and that um, um, multifamily is, seems to be the, the generator of revenue. Does your numbers take into consideration the affordability and the projects we're not supposed to know about how they, how the, the, the fact that, that a LIHTC project or a project that, that it doesn't, it even does it not even matter if it's in residential or commercial development, projects that get these bonuses or these adjustments, they, are, they, don't, they don't necessarily participate in the tax base. And they don't, and they may be not participating for decades. So would it be fair to say that when we're looking at this data and these metrics, that there should be a place that's broken out that shows where those type of developments are and how they are impacting the ability in order to generate a fair amount of revenue for where they're at, they're sitting in. Now, great question. So I think the, the analysis that was done on behind the scenes looked at tax exempt properties as well, uh, in addition to other types of properties uh, and, uh, that were assessed by the appraisal district, both Collin County, Dallas County, et cetera. So all of those were taken into consideration and we can provide kind of the, the behind the scenes of how that science was done, but that was, uh, that was part of uh, the analysis was to look at also the tax exempt properties and how the tax structure um, is being analyzed and assessed as well. So can I, can I make the assumption or the assessment that the areas that have more of these tax exempt um, developments are being economically depressed in the fact they are overwhelmed with this and they don't have the opportunity to participate in the fairness of bringing the, the right amount of revenue to the city. Um, I guess I couldn't say that that connection with the tax exempt properties to what you just mentioned, um, it's basically a kind of just looking at the, 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 the tax prop, the tax value from the assessed properties that from the different uh, appraisal districts and not including the taxes and properties, but I think another layer of kind of analysis could be looking at which properties are in that tax exempt area and maybe trying to pull and kind of get to what you're trying to get to in terms of maybe is there, is there a particular density of tax exempt properties that we should look at depending on where it is in the city? I think, I think you're onto something that could be uh, beneficial to add to the analysis. I do appreciate that. Well, yeah, I, my, my, what, I, what I'm trying to get at in my question, the, the foundation of my questioning is that when, we, when we're saying we need housing and we need this type of housing, we look at it at, on, these, on your data points, we look at it at a high scale, but, we're, but it's not drilling down enough to say, do, does, is there any area of the city that has too much or has enough of this type of development and needs to to grow in a different way. So, I believe this analysis, um, the, the LIHTC properties, because that that tax credit isn't a property tax credit, 
Um, I don't think it factors that in. Um, but I will say I, I think in, it's probably more found in a racial equity plan about the concentration of those LIHTC pro, those LIHTC, uh, uh, projects and the need to have those not be concentrated in a particular area of Dallas, but throughout the entire city. And I, I think, um, and I don't believe in forward Dallas, we have Pacific language about that, but I think that's something that we can definitely add in um, for one of the implementation items. Yes, ma'am. And when you add that, that, that area in, is it, would it be a fair ask to say, to, to, to have a, a, a data point that says where we are today and what we need to do tomorrow in order to make it more equitable throughout the city. Yeah, I think we can look at what our housing department has and what our uh, racial equity, um, what those um, departments have to see if they already have that data. So then we can just piggyback upon that and reinforce the aspect, but I do think it's a fair ask, yes. Or link it from Fort Dallas because it's it's a it's a it's a it's an ever changing um, uh, uh, data. The cha data is not sta sta not stagnant. So if there is a way to link it from Fort Dallas to the housing or whoever has the data, then it would be a beneficial um, link that says this is where we are at any given time based on where the numbers say we need to go. Right. And, and so we know on a, on a rolling basis where we are and where we need to go. Right, I'm gonna also highlight uh, more work that our uh, data analytics department they're doing was actually doing something similar where they think about not just analyzing what's on the ground but thinking about kind of future scenarios in terms of based on city policy, what those policies are telling us we need to do or where we need to go uh, from a land use perspective and then starting to provide that data to this body, to council, et cetera, decision makers so they can have a bit more understanding in terms of if we go down this path, this is gonna mean this. If we go down this path, it's gonna mean this. So that's something that they're also developing uh, as well in addition to refining this analysis uh, just to provide the city and decision makers with more uh, data to help with their decisions. And hopefully <clears throat> in two years or a year or three years, we're back here updating Forward Dallas. We're not waiting 18 years to do it again. So we can revisit the topic again and again. If it does need, to, if it's changed in five years, we can go ahead and say, hey, we, we accomplished a lot of stuff. We, need, we can take that implementation off because we have um, diversified our LIHTC projects. So. Thank you so much. Commissioner Rubin. Yeah, just two questions slash comments. One, you know, I know enough about the financing of, of affordable housing just to be dangerous, but I'm by no means an expert in it. But I think it's really important um, if we continue this discussion about the tax impacts to have sort of a basic summary, and I think Pat, uh, Mr. Blades acknowledged this about how the differing finance mechanisms, you know, impact tax revenue. For example, PFCs pull something off the property tax rolls for a long time, whereas LIHTC is tax credits that go to the developers. So as, as Mr. Blade said, those don't necessarily impact property tax revenues. So I think if we get back into this, having someone sort of able to walk through the menu of options and explain the, the tax impacts, that would be very helpful. Um, it, the other thing is going to Commissioner Blair's point, I think it's, you know, very important to consider, um, you know, how tax credit housing is dispersed throughout the city. I mean, that's been something that the city's been dealing with, both from a racial equity um, standpoint and from a, you know, litigation standpoint for quite some time now. Um, so I, I want to, you know, I think it's, you know, important to consider putting something in here that addresses that. At the same time, it's important to sort of, you know, try to acknowledge that, that you know, not everything that gets zoned for multifamily necessarily will end up being a tax credit project. So, you know, sending the right signal to the folks on, you know, who have pulled the levers on the tax credit project side, um, I think is, is very important through this document. At the same time, acknowledging that there, you know, can be really wonderful, you know, 
multifamily development in areas that you know have probably seen numerically a disproportionate share of of LIHTC projects doesn't mean that we should send you know every multi proposed multifamily development to the trash bin there we need to sort of find the right approach where we can address housing needs but at the same time um, you know take into account that there are issues with how we distribute light tech throughout the city. I don't have all the answers, but I think we can strike a good balance in this document. No point taken. Thank you so much. Commissioner Herbert. Yes, um, I'm going to actually agree with Mr. Rubin. Um, I'm learning to respect your seat in place 15 um, and the overall view that it takes to be there. But just recently, we PFC or the, the finance corporations just approved three of these bases in my district. Um, they didn't come to zoning because the zoning was already there. Um, so, so we are being inundated and continue to be inundated outside of the zoning practice. And that's what scares us. Um, to that point, we've taken on the warehouses and, and I wanna, I'm just, I'm giving the bases and I wanna be clear because I'm preparing for a huge neighborhood meeting and I want to make sure we have what we need, right? But We've taken on the warehouses and in the past we've been told we need these warehouses to pay for the low income developments that we have in the sub. Um, and then we reveal that actually the warehouses are paying for the entire tax base of this city, especially in some of the larger, more prosperous, prosperous areas who are grandfathered into low property taxes. For, for instance, um, there's areas of this city that pay much less taxes and live in a much more affluent area than I do because I wasn't grandfathered into some of these old practices of, of the way we do things. So how do we show that data point, that the warehouses that we have taken on the burden in my community, economically, environmentally, um, in some of the larger infill areas have already been taken by these warehouses, how can we show that we are at capacity and we are doing our part to not take care of just of the poor people in the southern area of the city, but these warehouses take care of the infrastructure needs for the entire city, especially the older parts of the city where financially they aren't producing as much as these warehouses are. Right, great question. So two things gonna highlight again, our data analytics team. So they're actually looking to um, add this kind of analysis that's on the screen for each council district. So you can see the breakdown for each council district and be able to kind of click and understand where and how that's uh, helping the tax generation for the city, but also too, I think another thing to th think about is you think about the, the amount of warehouse in your district, for example. So from a tax generation perspective, might not be as much as we're looking at this graph citywide, but that could be generating a lot of jobs for that particular area. So we're not looking at jobs, we're just looking at the tax generation for the city. Uh, so this is just one data point to factor in the plethora of different kind of uh, data points you're going to need to understand what your district's going to look like. But uh, yes, that particular department, that particular team, they are developing a tool so you can drill down to your specific council district and understand what does that mean and what does the future needs to look like to, to help understand, well, what the future needs to look like from a land use perspective and then also how do you provide that to your community to help them understand what, what the future should look like from a land use perspective. Thank you, and I think that's important. I'm, I'm preaching to my community that each neighborhood needs a neighborhood plan, right. um, and that forward Dallas can help us guide those neighborhood plans, but those neighborhood plans will be our protection as we move forward, and I think that data helps me Definitely. Um, bring that home. Thank you. All right, so I'm going actually piggybacking from a uh, discussion that uh, Commissioner Chernock mentioned with the uh, medium multiple. So for those not familiar with what, what the medium multiple is, and this is actually pretty, pretty uh, interesting kind of uh, back of the napkin type of analysis. When trying to look at the affordability of a particular city or neighborhood or, or place in, 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 the, in the U.S. and the world, um, there's a kind of general analytics um, that people usually do where they look at the medium home value and then divide that by the medium household income. So what we did we try to go back to 2000. Uh, we're still developing the data from 2000 to 2009. But when you start to look at the medium home value and you divide that by the medium home, the medium household income, um, you, then, you can then start to plot what that looks like um, over time. And then there's some kind of best practices in terms of when you make that um, 
that, um, that mathematical calculation uh, gives you a number from anywhere from one to 10. Uh, so generally, if you're between one and three, you're pretty affordable. Uh, if you're between three and four, you're moderately affordable. Uh, if you're between four and five, that's seriously unaffordable. And then when you go up to above five, that's severely unaffordable. Uh, when you think of like San Diego, Los Angeles, they're up in the five plus ranges. So um, based on some, some feedback from Commissioner Chernock, which was, a, uh, was just trying to look at, can we get that data and just to see what that looks like over time for the city of Dallas. So for the most uh, of the city's history in the last 20 years, we've been pretty affordable, moderate, moderate, moderately affordable. Uh, but as you look at the last few years, we're starting to creep up into that unaffordable severely affordable range. Uh, still, we're not in the red yet, uh, but it's important just to see the trends of our land use has been the same since 2006, um, but we've been getting more and more people to the city. So we have to think about, okay, as we are looking at just the land use component and the housing component, what should we be thinking about in the future in terms of trying to make our city more affordable? So in addition to this, uh, what I also did was added just some cities throughout the country for comparison's sake. So uh, I, I put San Diego, I put Chicago, I put Houston and some other cities, but I wanna look at three cities specifically. Uh, Chicago, uh, that's around where we are right now, 4.7. Uh, when you think about Chicago, you think about, well, that's a very dense area, that's a very dense part of the city. Um, so when we compare the city's affordability to Chicago, for example, um, it's important to look at just how they've started to look at their land uses and how they're trying to be, um, how they're trying to get ahead of the game in terms of not just density, but other land use practices. Uh, although the city of Dallas is not at all close to the density that Chicago is, and we're not saying that that's where we should go, um, it's important to compare where we are as a city right now to where cities like Chicago, New York are uh, now and in the future. Uh, the second city I wanna look at is actually San Diego. And this is actually probably the the one I want us to drill into is that San Diego, in terms of land area, similar to Dallas. Uh, we are 382 square miles. Uh, they are 379 square miles. Um, in terms of density, the city of Dallas is 3,800. I think San Diego is around 4,000. Uh, when we look at the population, the city of Dallas is the 10th, 9th largest city. Uh, San Diego is the 8th largest city. So a lot of similarities from a land use perspective population perspective, land use perspective, as we're thinking about um, the land use in the city, if we, if we, just thinking about, if we keep things the way that they are, we could be like a San Diego, but what happens is that you have to tax people more to be able to kind of maintain that particular type of land use, uh, you know, setup. So I think as we think about in the future of what the city of Dallas could be, I'm, I'm, I populated all of these on the, on the map, just kind of show different um, comparisons in terms of wh where we are, where we could be depending on you know, different factors that either stay the same or if we think about uh, moving other directions. Uh, another thing I wanted to also show is Houston. It's Texas City, uh, larger than Dallas, but in terms of their land use policies, they don't, have, they don't have zoning, they have other tools that act as zoning, but what they do, they, they provide a bit more flexibility in terms of how um, development happens in the city. So as we think about also um, how the city of Dallas and other, other cities in the, in, the, in, the, in the country are being developed, another component to think about is just regulations, land use regulations, and how we want that to assist with the affordability perspective moving forward. And I'm not sure, Commissioner Shornock, if you had anything kind of specific to that medium multiple uh, that you will kind of want us to kind of do a more investigation, but I just wanted to kind of show the city's trend, um, and then also other examples that exist uh, throughout the country, just for comparison's sake, and thinking about what does the future look like, or what could the future look like uh, if we keep things as is, or if we think about um, how should we modify or think through regulations, how should we look through land use, and other components that we're thinking through as a project team. Yeah, I have some comments on that. Um, so this, this that is super useful for me to just visually see the trends. You know, when I started paying attention to housing, which was about 20, 25 years ago, the discussion around it was Dallas needs housing. That was what was said. And then about four or five years past that, it said that Dallas has some housing challenges. 
fast forward about four or five years when we were doing forward Dallas, Dallas has a housing problem. Then now you hear Dallas has a housing crisis. So when we look at the 20 year trend, we are, we are trajectorying towards a housing catastrophe. So the, this is when people say that housing crisis, you know, we're, we've heard it so much that it doesn't really, it doesn't pack a punch anymore. But we really should be sounding the alarm bells because it's not unreasonable for this number to go to 10. And the interesting thing about this number is when it starts getting away from you, it becomes almost impossible to self-correct. And if you look at the housing policies of San Diego and San Francisco and New York City, you talk to people that are in the trenches there, they all say, it's desperate, it's dire, we really don't know what to do, we're trying to pass policy, we're trying to balance everything, and it's really having no effect. And it's a very clear path to seeing how you could ruin your city. It's sort of a death by a thousand cuts kind of thing that slowly happens over time. And then really, when you take this data, you know, sure we see this here, it's a graph, there's a bunch of dots, blah, 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 but we really say like, what are the implications of this? It was kind of what um, Commissioner Shade was saying is that when you look at how the cities, if you look at a business and you look how it's run, and if you look at the economics and you look at the revenue generation and what that needs to provide and the city services, and then you look at the budget, if the city of Dallas was a business on the stock market, there wouldn't be anybody investing in it because it looks dire. And I just don't think, you know, week in, week out, commissioners or the, the city plan commission, the city council, we're, we're, we're doing our business and we're, we're trying to do the best we can with all these cases. But when you zoom out and you really look at this long-term trend, to me, it's really, really concerning. And every once in a while you have these inflection points where you, you, have, you have an opportunity to do something. 06 was one uh, when we had the first forward Dallas plan. But the thing that's interesting is that it's called the Ford Dallas plan, but it kind of is the former plan. What we're talking about is the plan that should have been in place 10 years ago, so we didn't get into this viewpoint. And there were a lot of people that said that in 06 when Ford Dallas was passed. There was very poignant, well-researched land use presented. The public got a hold of it. They freaked out. Then the city uh, council got concerned because their voter base was about to go away. The whole plan got watered down. It got passed. Everybody felt great about it. Fast forward that policy 10 years and look where we are. And my concern is that we're about to do the exact same thing. There's very well reasoned, very well researched land use that's been presented to us. The public is now getting a look at it. There's a small segment, and when I say small, it is small. They yell loud, but if we're actually looking at the numbers, if it's a thousand, if it's five, let's just say it's 10,000 people that are screaming bloody murder about this. There's 1.3 million people in this city that we're trying to make land use uh, policy for. This median multiple is even more shocking when you start to applying it to the rent, renting numbers. So I hope we can at some point take a look at that because half of this city, I'm told, is a renter. And every month, we pass policy at this horseshoe that affects them directly, and they almost never have a collective voice. And that's a, that's a big problem. When we're making land use decisions for half of our citizenry that never even has an opportunity to, to speak here. And I think that somebody needs to give them a voice. So hopefully we can get those numbers. Definitely we can work on that. Thank you so much. Commissioner Kingston, please. Well, <clears throat> I guess sort of piggybacking on Chernock's point, the demographics of the people who are yelling the loudest are also the people who are most likely um, not to be here that much longer um, in some instances, either because they will not be able to afford to stay where they are for a variety of reasons. They'll age into different type of housing. 
um, or or whatever. And so I think we need to keep that in mind too, because we should be developing the city for tomorrow, not the city for you know two decades ago. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that um, oh, I had another thought. What was it? <laughs> Dang, I'll, it'll come back to me. Never mind. It's early. I will come back. We'll keep going, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I think just one one other data point to add. You know, just looking at San Diego, uh, when we look at their median uh, household income versus the city of Dallas, you might think it's a whole lot higher. It's actually around sixty-eight thousand uh, versus uh, city of Dallas was around sixty-two. Uh, but their housing uh, median value is up to seven hundred thousand. Uh, so when you think about that, those who, are, who actually have or own homes there probably aren't the ones that are the median uh, demographic. So it's important to think about going, going to that um, rental piece that there's a whole other group that either rents in that particular uh, city and rent in the city of Dallas that are looking for uh, reform and land use that can help them stay instead of having to leave the city. And last thing I want to touch on again, I'm harping on data today is kind of another component of Fort Dallas that we're looking at the environmental justice piece, uh, you know, with our uh, existing conditions report where we had, you know, identified that 700,000, uh, 70,000 acres of residential land um, of, of that, you know, 5,200 is within 500 feet of industrial buffer. We're going to be updating that analysis to include 1,000 feet just to see the, the magnitude of the industrial zone districts in the city. And that's going to help us identify areas that we need to focus our attention um, from a, either needs to be rezoned or the land use needs to be rethought about um, just to make sure that those communities aren't ju in, in, in just justly affected by um, the types of uses that are around them. So just wanted to kind of touch on the data for kind of the first part of this as we delve into the discussion uh, with community residential. I'm not sure if y'all had any other uh, feedback related to the data, but uh, if not, we can always uh, come back or we can, we can come back later um, at another meeting. Commissioner Carpenter, please. While we're, I, I know I never can let industrial topics uh, pass us by, but I think, you know, one thing we need to look at, I mean, about one of the comments I sent in to you yesterday was that this 500 feet distance needed to be increased, so I'm glad to hear that. But coupled with some of the data that you sent us earlier, uh, that we were presented earlier, about the um, relative value of, um, you know, uh, different types of land and how much tax revenue they generate. Industrial property was one of the very lowest tax generators per acreage. I think one of the things the city needs to look at, and I don't mean this to uh, be understood as a, uh, you know, some condemnation of all industrial property, I don't mean that, but I think we do need to take, uh, while we're looking at a, you know, a high level view, is how much acreage in the city of Dallas do we really want to devote to certain types of industrial uses? You know, truck parking lots and vehicle salvage lots and, and those sorts of things that, you know, in some of these cases, you know, industrial property has been, um, you know, it's been co-located with minority neighborhoods and with, um, you know, areas along the Trinity. You know, is that the highest and best use for the property long term? No, that's a great question. I think that's probably a decision for kind of you all and council to kind of help develop, to think through where do we want to go from a land use perspective? What are the priorities? Again, you know, like I mentioned before with this tax density analysis, it's only one aspect, you know, looking at tax density, looking at other economics, look at transportation, look at the environmental justice piece. Those are all factors that we're going to have to make decisions to to determine if you want to go this direction, it might affect this other part of the city or whatever we want to do from another aspect of the city. But I think what we, all we're trying to do is just provide that uh, as much data as possible, and then the decision makers can determine which direction to go. But that's 100% kind of along the lines of what we're thinking is if we're looking at these other land uses from a tax density perspective, uh, what do we want to do moving forward? Do we want to prioritize more of that? Do we want to prioritize less of that and have other cities uh, be the, the leaders of certain industries. Uh, not a decision for us to make, but that's a great point that you bring up. And, and I do have one other point, because I, I know I've questioned repeatedly um, a, a statistic that, that's occurred and uh, it's been presented in Forward Dallas about where the location of industrial property is, and it always says some very high percentage, I don't remember, 80% or so is in the southern service sector. But if you look at this map, 
you know, a very sizable, I'll call chunk of industrial property is in District 6. You know, it's to the the upper left-hand corner for lack of, you know, the northwest part of Dallas. So it just makes me wonder how, how that figure, um, that percentage figure was derived about the location of industrial property in the city, because this map seems to to show pretty clearly that 80% of it is not in the southern sector. Yeah, and I think we uh, we mentioned that in, pr in previous discussions that, that that statistic was gonna be updated and refined. I think it was f focused on certain portions of certain districts. I think the way it was written uh, was just confusing. So we, we've rewritten that. I, can, I don't have the language with me yet, but we can definitely touch base uh, after this meeting about what that language looks like. All right, so thank you. Oh, sorry. Commissioner Forsyth, please. Yes. Could you uh, tell me what you mean or what is meant by the term missing middle housing? Please. <clears throat> so right now our land development code um, allows for a single family detached house and is written favorably for a single family detached house and then is written favorably for a very large apartment building or apartment complex. Um, that's the majority of the housing that's located in Dallas. 44% um, are single family detached units. 35% are apartment buildings that are bigger than 10. So that's 80% of all of our housing in Dallas. The missing middle is not everybody wants to live in a single family detached house. Not everybody wants to live in a 10 story tall apartment building. Some people might want to live in a townhouse or they might want to live in a fourplex or they might want to live in a cottage court. In our land development code, um, isn't written to create those opportunities. And so that missing middle is that, that whole thing between the single family home, which we need to build more of, and the 10 story apartment building, which we need to build more of, but everything in between, that that's the missing middle, that we haven't built that for the past 70 years, and that's opportunities to build things that aren't one of those two, but are somewhere in the middle that provides that opportunity um, for that uh, increased housing choice, increased smaller scale gentle density, um, in our different communities. You, uh, in your introductory uh, presentation, I, I, I wrote down, I think you stated that the Ford Dallas plan does not, uh, you know, call for building duplex, and I presume you meant multiplex units in single family neighborhoods. Was that, was that a part of your presentation? Try to try to allure. Oh, can you direct me to which slide specifically? Just want to make sure we're in speaking. In the beginning, your your first slides where you were what Ford Dallas is and what Ford Dallas is not. I, I thought I, I I wrote down that you said that Ford Dallas doesn't call for building duplexes in single family neighborhoods. Did I? Or, or multiplex. No, I think what we have here is. Uh, Fort Dallas doesn't recommend that developers be able to develop multiplexes on all vacant lots. Multiplex, okay. But but isn't you when when you use your data to show that single family detached homes uh, neighborhoods only are generating a million dollars per acre versus the single family uh, attached, uh, which are the the apartment complexes they're generating $4 million per acre, I think you said. Isn't the implication from what I'm hearing today is, is that basically single family neighborhoods aren't paying enough to, uh, to uh, uh, finance uh, the, the, the maintenance that is required in those neighborhoods. So that the target for the missing middle housing is single family neighborhoods that are the single family attached neighborhoods, right? That's the target for middle, missing middle. So this is one point to consider. It's not the only point to consider. There are a number of other points to consider about what single, what, what, what neighborhoods that have a lot of single family homes, what they contribute to the community of Dallas. Um, you know, this is one point to show, yes, if we only have single family detached housing, and that's the, the main thing that happens in our community. It's hard for a city to maintain good services with a lower tax base. That's one data point to consider that if there are other opportunities, because again, you know, this shows that you can build, if you built some single family attached, right, to uh, Commissioner Chir Chernock's point, what's that point where you've built enough in the city overall that that single family attached can then 
contribute to that number that says, okay, now we are at an average of 1.8 million an acre. Okay, that's good enough. And the single family detached property is contributing to that, but we've built other stuff in other areas that help offset some of that tax burden. Have you uh, changed any of the language in the community residential place type in the Ford Dallas plan that addresses the concerns that you've heard from the, the residents at these town halls that are very concerned that what, you're, what you mean when you talk about uh, infill development uh, and, and, and missile, missing middle housing, that, that you, what you mean is that if there's a vacant lot in a single family neighborhood, like an R5 and R75, that a developer can come in and build a duplex or a triplex or a multiplex up to nine units without, by right, without even going through a zoning change. I mean, that is, that is what we've heard from right. the neighbors. And that's a great segue to kind of this community residential review where we touch on uh, those concerns that we've heard from the community and how we're gonna be addressing those through updated text changes. So I guess with that, if there's no other questions regarding the previous components, we can delve into that to answer your question, Mr. Forsyth. I just wanna clarify, just yeah. a couple yes. questions to that point right. as we move forward. I think it's a good basis, right? A good leeway. Right. This plan gives me as a resident in a community leader, in a neighborhood organization to say, this is what we want. Thank you for giving me the tools. My neighborhood does not call for multiplex, scratch that off. My neighborhood doesn't call for industrial, scratch that off. No duplexes on this block, but on that block, it makes sense, right? So this gives me a guide to develop a sturdy plan to move forward to protect my neighbors in my neighborhood. Is that 100%, correct? 100%, 100%. Thank you. Yeah, I think it gives you a, a guide, Commissioner. Um, I, th I think in some communities you're going to need a little bit more detailed guide. As you mentioned, like just saying, okay, no industrial over here, this can do that. When you say, okay, absolutely no duplexes anywhere in this entire um, area, it's not going to go that level. Um, that's where we need that neighborhood plan, as you mentioned, to say that street, yes, this street, no. Commissioner Rubin. In following up at that point in the community residential, as Commissioner Herbert says, you know, duplex is here, but not here in this, this neighborhood. One of the things that community residential talks about is if we do start to discuss incorporating missing middle, you know, into community residential areas like duplexes, where it might be located, perhaps, you know, making the more dense sort of housing closer to corridors and other things like that. And then we'll probably get into this later, but also things like design standards. So if you get duplexes near, um, you know, a single family neighborhood or, or single family zoning, how do we make these duplexes look and feel, you know, in appropriate right. scale, you know, considering the adjacent single family residences. Yeah, no, no, I feel like you all are taking our thunder away because that's where we're, okay. we're about to go next. So uh, kind of going to what we just heard on this horseshoe, uh, there are two major concerns uh, that we've heard. One, the land uses and language should better reflect a predominantly single family neighborhood in this plan. Uh, two, speaking about the location or criteria you just brought up, uh, what protections do single family neighborhoods have um, and that the fabric won't be destroyed by this plan? So we're gonna touch on how uh, our, our staff and the project team has thought to address those concerns and get your feedback from that too as well. So going to the first, uh, the first issue that we hear, um, before we even delve into that, we we'll just wanna put a kind of a note that uh, the community residential, aside from the small town residential place type, is the only place type that shows single family as the primary use. So I think a lot of people we hear that, where is the single family place type? Community residential is the only place type other than the small town residential that shows single family as the primary use. So this is important to bring up because I know we've talked in previous meetings that we should include single family in other place types. We can do that, but I just want to be, be very 
cognizant about the effects of doing that, then they would have other place types that have single family land use um, as the primary, and then you would lose having a single family specific place type. So just a thought to, to think about as we go through these other slides that the community residential place type is the only other than the small town residential that has single family land uses as the primary land use. All right, so two, going into um, some of the suggestions we've heard. So we're gonna to touch on some, um, on some of the recommendations from this body and also addressing some of the issues that you all brought up. So one, in terms of updating and clarifying uh, what single family is in this, single family detached is in this document. Um, one of the suggestions was to remove some of the language in the, in the matrix would have the different land uses uh, specifically to the single family detached that ADU reference that, that, was, that was causing some confusion. Uh, so based on some feedback that we got earlier was just to remove that um, within this particular section and kind of elaborate upon that in our implementation section. So here we'll just show single residential unit. Uh, that was one of the updates that was provided to us last meeting. Uh, two, uh, another way of addressing those concerns is to update the multiplex uh, land use here from its primary designation, what it is in the document, to a supporting designation. That way, we are still driving home the fact that this community residential place type is single family uh, focused in nature, and those other uses are supporting, which is basically what the document was, which is, the, which is what the place type is identifying. Um, three, going to the locational aspect of uh, the concerns. So as we look to to think about historic districts, conservation districts, NSOs, starting to show that in the in the plate in the document. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is adding that to uh, the place type map. So what we have here, we're showing it on the citywide map, and we're still playing with how we show uh, historic districts in the citywide version of the document. You know, as you see here, there are a lot of small black dots that's kind of hard to understand. So we might be blowing up. Uh, some of those areas are kind of playing with different colors to be able to have people still see where those are, but still not cloud what the, the place type map is showing and indicating. Um, three, again, just four uh, total, total comments, is as we think about where we're um, focusing um, the density that we're looking at, uh, the complete streets that we have in the city provides that tool to where we can uh, focus gentle density along those corridors. So as you look at this particular map here, for example, where you have other smaller streets in this residential neighborhood, uh, you can focus that density on those complete streets, still can maintain the integrity of some of these neighborhoods, um, but we're still thinking about how do we add and where does density, uh, gentle density get added into this plan document. That was one piece uh, I want to just thank uh, Commissioner Kingston for that suggestion in terms of looking at our complete streets, looking at our thoroughfare plan, and thinking about using that um, in terms of how we uh, integrate more density, but also protect the single family neighborhoods in the plan. Um, another item that we, we have here is, we talked about this before, is just removing that CRA-3 language about the vacant properties um, in neighborhoods. I think that was, that was causing some, some angst among the community. Uh, so just removing that language entirety just kind of, just I think helps to just uh, clarify how development should happen, where it should go, um, and not uh, kind of saying specifically that we're looking to, you know, um, target vacant properties and communities. So I think the feedback from this body a few meetings ago was to remove that language entirely. And I think second to the last comment, this is one, I think you all have a printout to this, uh, was, it, was incorporate uh, preservation language uh, in the document. So we were starting to just massage and think through what this could say and how we were saying it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it just for those who are online who can't read this document, you all have this. Um, on your, uh, hopefully on, on your computers or printed out. Uh, so historic districts, conservation districts, neighborhood stabilization overlays and SOs were created through thoughtful neighborhood self-determination and established a more granular vision for the communities than the four Dallas place types. That more granular vision in the historic districts, conservation districts, and NSOs is respected, and this plan does not change nor make a recommendation to change 
uh, the zoning for any historic or conservation or any of those districts that we mentioned beforehand. So that's the draft language we've, we've crafted. Uh, we'll use this meeting to maybe massage that further, uh, but that's another uh, recommendation that we have is to incorporate that not just into the uh, introduction of the plan document, but maybe into the, the place type, this particular place type itself, just to reiterate that we're not looking to um, change any of those types of overlays that we have in the city. And the last um, kind of recommendation uh, for the community residential concerns that we've heard is just actually defining primary and supporting uses in the document. Uh, we actually didn't explicitly define that. So uh, having the primary use defined as that more prevalent and prominent land use that plays a pivotal role in characterizing the place type and then supporting use is the less prevalent use that serves to support the primary land use in the place type. So, so we're hoping that all those recommendations, and then we went through that pretty quickly, uh, helps address a lot of the concerns that you all brought up um, in the last few months that we've heard from the community and that we actually just talked about um, through this horseshoe. And if there are any of those that you would like us to, to go back to or, or massage further, uh, we are looking for you all to kind of continue that conversation. Me for sure. So just so I'm understanding this clearly in the process of how we refine the, 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 the plan. So your decisions to take those out were informed by land use and data or they were informed by other plan commissioners who just didn't want it there? Uh, multiple kind of aspects. So as we're getting the feedback from this body, from the community and from data, I think being able to address those concerns from those different aspects, uh, we think can still keep the integrity of the plan, but also to provide more securities to the communities who are, who are thinking this plan is doing something that it's not. All right, so you made a, a recommendation that had it in there. So several of those, like multiplex got, got changed. Um, so there was something about having it in there that you believe was the best practice. So that obviously uh, decreases the chances of densi density. Did you consider if we're going to take it out of that this place type, is there a way that we can reallocate it towards nodes, corridors, and some of the things that we had brought up before? I, I saw you reference that, but I don't really see where that actually shows up right. in a primary thoroughfare. Right, so well, two things, that's a great question. So we're not removing, for example, multiplex from this place type, it's just being updated to be a supporting use. Uh, it's still allowed in the place type, but I, I think understand. this- but, but we could just use the same rationale to keep it with a, with a black dot. We, we could, so I think either way, it's best depending on this body, where, where they wanna go with that. So I think based on what we've heard, I think a lot, a lot of the community thought that, you know, th that being a primary use, that provided just some insecurities for the, the feedback we were getting. I think in terms of changing it to supporting, it's still allowed, and the additional com components that we mentioned about where it's allowed to be focused on, um, we can kind of help address the where and the how, hopefully through those tweaks, but if there's any direction that you want to provide to, to tweak that, we're open to that conversation. Right. I, just, I just want to throw this out there. I just feel like we need to be going with what's needed and what's what's substantiated by current thinking and land use and not what's what's easy and convenient. Look, I get it. It's it's not popular with some people in the neighborhood. It's not easy for me to have conversations with them e either. But at the end of the day, this isn't just like we're going with what's easy and what what's right. politically convenient. Like I th I really feel like when we're making changes to this that they need to be substantiated in land use reasoning. We are here to provide a recommendation in land use. Let the politics happen at the next level. Just one quick note on the process, commissioners, before we go, uh, keep going to questions. You know, we, we do have a recommendation from CLEP, and you know that is why this, it purposely says they're suggested updates. You know, all changes are gonna require a motion, and, and I would imagine that probably 90% of what, you know, the adjustments that we'll make, we'll all agree on, and there'll be some where we'll have to take separately and, and take a separate vote. Uh, but at this point, they are just suggested updates uh, that are gonna require a motion to be adjusted at the hearing. Uh, Commissioner Forsyth, followed by Commissioner Rubin. Well, I will say, based on you know my uh, the feedback that I get from members of the community, I, I applaud you for, for for putting forward these changes, 
And, and I think that the essence here is, is for compromise to ensure that this plan can go forward and be approved not only here but also at the City Council. So I think you, by making these changes, are, are making giant strides in, in, in that direction. Uh, I, I would ask you if you would consider um, on the statement regarding the historic districts and the conservation districts uh, over in the neighborhood stabilization overlays, and you talk about neighborhood self-determination, I, I would encourage you to add a statement that also that, uh, that this does not preclude neighborhoods from uh, self-determination in, in the future to be able to establish these districts in the future. Not, not just protecting the existing ones, but also enabling or encouraging neighborhoods to be able to do this in the future as well. Yes, sir. Thank you for your suggestion. Great recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Rubin. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Please, no, please ahead, Commissioner Forsyth. My apologies. I'm, I'm, please continue, sir. The only other thing that I, uh, again, I think you've made great strides here. There, there are uh, still, uh, help me to understand, on 317 of the community residential uh, uh, place type, under streetscape and parking, this is community residential. It says, Con considered shared parking spaces, including the prioritization of street parking that can serve both residential and business needs. Uh, I, 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 I guess, you know, people do read this to say that you're encouraging street par on street parking. In community residential. Yeah, I think last time we uh, talked about that specifically, I believe we modify that language. I can't remember what we tweaked it to, but I think next time we do bring that update to you all, that should have that um, updated language based on the feedback. And I think we, I think we mentioned removing or tweaking that to. I can't remember. I, I don't want to speak out of hand, but I think we did play with the language there, and we'll propose and bring that before you. I think it's the, yeah. the last part of that sentence. Is that? Where, where it's the, the shared residential and commercial spaces. Right. Yeah. Okay. Those are my only comments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ruben Fowler, Commissioner Kingston. Yeah, um, there's a lot to dig into here, so um, I'm just going to probably attack it from one angle right now and may come around on, on a different angle on, on future rounds. You know, I hear a lot about where we locate the missing middle in the neighborhoods being a, a key consideration. Um, but I think a lot of the fear about some of the missing middle um, is in response to some of the product that we see coming on to the market today in light of our existing regulations. And I'll take duplexes, for example, and I'll even you know, point to the duplexes in Mount Auburn, which I believe has its own plan development district that allows for these duplexes, but uh, in it, I think the duplexes in Mount Auburn pretty much mirror base code for duplex. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but what we see with duplexes are these, you know, giant, you know, I think they go up to, you know, 36 feet. Um, they take up the, you know, basically the entire lot. And I think probably, you know, most damning about these in my mind is that they are basically all garage in front, and that is a function of our city's parking requirements. Even though single-family houses um, only, or single-family zoned areas only require one parking spot per, off-street parking spot per dwelling unit. For duplex, it's two per dwelling unit, so you've got to park four. So we get these all garage duplexes across the city. Is that a fair description of, of where we are on duplexes? Yes, sir. So, so I think a lot of the fear about some of this density, you know, apart from location comes comes from where we are with, you know, our design standards, lack of design standards, and in some of the other zoning requirements that lead to really undesirable housing product. Um, so I think, you know, all of these changes are, are worth considering. I'm not sure if I, you know, one way or the other on any of them just yet. But one thing that I think is could be really important and really helpful if we talk about, you know, missing middle and, you know, how does that integrate into um, existing areas that are predominantly single family is various, you know, ways that we can 
um, address how to make it context sensitive. And I don't think we're going to be able to hit on all of those or any of those in the forward, specifically recommend any of those in the forward Dallas document itself. That's probably too granular, but I think it would be potentially really helpful to sort of include a, a suite of options that, that might be considered, um, you know, all to, you know, harmonize missing middle with single family houses. You know, some examples might be, um, you know, coming up with the zoning districts that, you know, cap height, lot coverage, massing, those sorts of things. Um, either, you know, through our existing zoning districts or even maybe including an infill, you know, residential category or categories that, you know, is sort of like a chameleon or chameleons that if you're plopped between two, you know, single family zone parcels, you know, the only real difference that you would see is that there would be, you know, a couple dwelling units allowed on a property versus, you know, just allowing a single dwelling unit, but you're really consistent with what's around you. Um, we might also talk about what parcel or parcels we'd allow, you know, this missing middle on, you know, maybe pre preferring corner lots or things like that if we do start to get into the core of neighborhoods. And I'm not saying that any of this, you know, needs to be a firm recommendation. I just think that as we hear all of the sort of concerns about missing middle and how it blends into our neighborhood, sort of showing a buffet of ways that we might be able to incorporate the missing middle and clearly, you know, stating that these are still up for discussion through further code amendments and other things might be the other way, uh, you know, an important way to sort of ease missing middle you know, into our city moving forward through this plan. Um, one other thing, and this may be a question for legal, is that in some of the correspondence that we've seen, um, you know, there's language about the missing middle being context sensitive, and some folks say, well, the state legislature banned us from, from regulating context in, I guess it was 2019 or 2017. And I think that's a reference to House Bill 2439, is that what? I, I, I would, I need to double check the House bill number. I do not okay. recall off the top of my head. And House bill 2049 says that the city can't regulate building materials, materials. beyond, um, you know, what the building codes require. Right. So if, you know, we can't say no stucco in this neighborhood. Correct. It has to be brick, but we can still include design standards like that address height, massing, lot coverage, lot size, yes, dwelling unit size, so on and so forth. That's correct. So we still have lots of tools to regulate context. It's just building materials is one where we're more limited in now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And it, it is a good point um, that in the Mount Arbor neighborhood, um, the PD over there, um, it, it does not have an additional design standards. So that's why you get basically uh, two garages uh, 50 feet wide of parking in the front yard and then a house on top of those two garages, which um, I would say uniformly throughout um, the districts, people don't like that. I don't think I've heard from any one of your districts that people actually like that design. Uh, that's one of the only things I can think, I can say pretty much uniformly that everybody in Dallas does not like those. Um, but when we've talked with, to your point, uh, uh, Vice Chair, uh, when we have talked with communities and neighborhoods, um, it is a lot of that scaling and that massing um, and the, the location of those garages that come up as an issue. Um, you know, I can speak for um, the South Dallas because we were doing an area plan over there and speaking with um, that task force where they said, yes, single family is great. You know, and duplexes, we don't have a huge problem with those either as long as they're not, you know, horrible looking duplexes. And so the design standards um, that we've worked with them um, um, on is, um, you know, two stories in height, the gable roof, garages in the back, porches in the front. Um, and again, that doesn't go against what the state says we can and can't do. We can do that within the state, but that gets a little bit of the scaling, the massing, the location of those garages um, that allow for a more context sensitive development in that community. Um, and as we go through the implementation section of this plan, we do have language that talks about how we need to start pursuing more of that because our current development code is a poor tool for creating context sensitive design in different communities uh, because again, um, what is context sensitive in Los Altos may not be context sensitive in Prestonwood. Um, those, 
there, there's a little, there's a difference of a context there. And so just understanding exactly what we can do and, and, and creating some of those different tools um, is something that um, Forward Dallas in the implementation section um, recommends. Yeah, that's a great segue in terms of uh, as all that language that you just brought up in terms of townhomes and the design standards as the code reform project is starting to, to kick off uh, and we look into the implementation section, I think we can provide some suggested either language or ways to think about how either that code reform should address design standards and also to another component of uh, the implementation section with the urban design section is looking at a citywide urban design guidance that can either be part of the code or be a, another project or, or guiding tool to provide those uh, protections guidance uh, to help address what you just mentioned. Just one, and you say how code reform should address design standards. I think should is a good point, but also could is important too. So folks understand that we have a suite of options through code reform going forward to address design standards rather than landing on particular design standards in this document. Yeah, thanks for that clarity. Thank you. Commissioner Kingston. I'm, I'm not sure that I have anything left that hadn't already been said. Thank you. Commissioner Hall, followed by Commissioner Herbert. Commissioner Herbert, please. Why, thank you, Commissioner Hall. Um, the, um, it, the first statement, because you asked for um, feedback on these types, in the statement about historical um, preservation areas, I thought it would be a good opportunity to include language or, um, there we go, thank you. Um, on that last sentence, when it says vision for the communities than the four Dallas place types, okay, that more granular vision in the HDCDs and SOs is respected and this plan does not change nor make a recommendation to change any neighborhood, including existing historic and conservation districts. Would that be considered? Can you just, just repeat that one more time for clarity? I think I have so, an answer, but I just want to make sure. So I'll start with, um, I've gotten, if you're not in a conservation district, you are not protected um, from residences, right? Is the, and I know that we, th this is reiterating that this is not a zoning change, right. right? So can we include language that includes other neighborhoods, a short statement about other neighborhoods as well in this statement, or is that overreaching? So yeah, I think, Close, I want to be, I want to clarify too. So some of these tools that we just identified here, these are zoning tools. Uh, so those are the tools that are gonna, to, to say what your community is. So if you are in a, uh, another location, which is single family, whatever, that is the, the zoning category, unless that particular landowner decides to change that. Um, I think we can probably add something kind of to the, to the, to yeah, the single family. I, I think, um, the, the concept that you're talking about, we can get to. Uh, in here, because we have Pacific Historic Districts, Conservation Districts, and Neighborhood Stabilization Overlays, those are, those are an established thing. We can recognize them. Um, we, we, our plan really can't recommend for neighborhoods because those aren't an established thing. And so I think there is something that we can get to there. Um, but just to say, we, we're not gonna change any neighborhoods is difficult because we, we haven't defined neighborhoods right. and it's not a... Gotcha. Yeah. But, but I think one thing that we did, we have talked about um, and we're trying to shop around how this would work or how we, we put it in here in terms of uh, authorized hearings that you know single family zonings wouldn't be uh, privy to that as well. So I think, I think we generally that, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, so we're just making sure that we can we can kind of legally do that. But I think that's a piece that we're thinking of adding or incorporating that would help with that protection piece uh, because we're not looking, uh, from what I've heard from this, this body and other elected officials, that we're looking to do a authorized uh, change for single family neighborhoods. So I think that component can be tweaked and massaged and that's what we're currently developing in-house. Yeah, Commissioner, I think it gets to um, something that I believe Commissioner uh, Forsyth brought up about the, that future neighborhood self-determination like if, if a community has gone through that a, a neighborhood planning process that should be what the vision is not a bigger overarching vision from forward dallas thank you yeah that that makes perfect sense i do appreciate the changes that you've made listening to the community um and in, inclusions of nso's is um is important especially to my community question um say a community has a, a pd 
right? Uh, the PD had three phases of residential, commercial, mixed use, so on, but the second two phases weren't completed. Um, does that PD need to be turned into a neighborhood plan to protect that, or that, that community, or should they look at that PD as their protection? It would be uh, case by case specific. There are some PDs where I would say you don't, where, you, where people have come in and they say we want a neighborhood plan and we look at their PD and we say we, you, you guys don't need it, you have your vision already, it's established through that PD. Other communities can come in and say, well we, you know, we have a PD and we look at the PD, you know, and, and like in South Dallas and there's almost nothing in it for the neighborhood. Um, it just reverts back to the base, so they don't have that vision. And so I guess I would say it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and if you have those examples, I'd be more than happy to sit down and say, okay, you know, does this need a neighborhood plan moving forward? Or no, that neighborhood did get that with that PD. Gotcha. And lastly, um, we talked about duplexes a lot in the design standards of duplexes. Have we included language or in the implementation of language that protects neighborhoods like Elm Thicket, um, 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 Ann Arbor, Lisbon Heights, Queen City, where these huge single family um, projects are being built um, in, in existing neighborhoods um, that are either too tall or too wide or too big, right? Um, but it's single family. The zoning is kind of on the ground already. Uh, is, do we talk about that? I know that's one of the reasons we went down this path from the very beginning, right? But have we gotten lost from that? So I, I would say, and Lawrence can, jump in any time, um, it gets to a little bit of what the, the vice chair uh, mentioned, that we do make recommendations that we we, we need to explore, that we, we need to figure out those because we don't have those tools right now in our toolbox, or if we do, it's it, there's a big lift on those neighborhoods and those communities to get that conservation district or historical district. Um, and so we, the recommend, the, the implementation section makes recommendations about exploring how to create more of those tools so that you don't have the grossly incompatible new housing. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Would, would you define neighborhood self-determination for me? So it's a difficult term to, 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 to get into, uh, but neighborhood self-determination um, essentially is when a community or neighborhood has come together and through a thoughtful, equitable process has self-determined what they want their vision for their community to be. Um, and for each different community, it's going to be a little bit different. Some get very detailed, others are less detailed. In the conservation districts and historical districts, there's a variety of that self-determination in those. Some get very much into specifically what color the window should be or the door should be. Others say, look, we just want you to be more intentional with the development of those housing. But they've all gone through that process where as a community they came together and through a planning process self-determined what the vision for that community would be. Does that require a charter that is filed with the county? So, uh, a, a charter? Like a homeowners association has to have a charter. So, most of the communities that have done historical districts or conservation districts don't have homeowners associations. Most of them have neighborhood associations, and there's a variety of how they've organized. Some do have, um, some have incorporated and are a 501c3 or 501c4. Some are, are not um, and, are, and are just an association of that community. But moving forward, you would not necessarily need to have a charter to do that neighborhood self-determination process. It's helpful to have that and to have that organization. But again, it would be a case-by-case -case process where a community comes together and maybe through the process of neighborhood self-determination, they do incorporate, become a nonprofit organization that we can officially work with. Does this, to do so, would that require a certain percentage of homeowners in the association to sign on? For a neighborhood association, I'd, I, I, would, I would ask legal. It, to my knowledge, it doesn't. Uh, for, the, for the conservation districts and historical districts and the neighborhood civilization overlays, yes, there are certain percentages about the, the, the individuals who have to sign off on that process and how they go through those votes. But just a neighborhood organization association, I don't believe there's a percentage there. Well, I guess I have visions of a few very vocal advocates forcing their beliefs on a large number of owners. Uh, yes, that gets back to the when we talk about what it, it's a thoughtful, equitable process, 
of neighborhood self-determination um, to do that neighborhood plan. And um, you know that's why the, the city has been a part of some of those. And sometimes it's, as you mentioned, it's a couple of strong voices who come together and they create their own plan that might not have been an equitable process that it hasn't been adopted by CPC or council. To, can I? I don't, I don't. Oh, okay. I, it's, it's sort of a fuzzy concept. Now, I live in a condo, so we have very strict charter, and it takes like 80% of us to change anything related to that charter. But uh, just the idea that a few vocal people in a neighborhood could self-determine 200 homes or what goes on in 200 homes or whatever seems sort of disturbing to me. I, I, I would have hoped there was a more legal uh, basis for we're going to self-determine based on a charter or a, a document or something that's registered with the, the, the authorities. Uh, and we've got buy-in from X percent of the owners in the neighborhood. And so again, the historical districts, the conservation districts and the neighborhood stabilization overlays, they have that those percentages in place that prevent a couple of strong voices from guiding everything, where you have to have a certain amount of signatures and a certain amount of votes of a certain amount of property owners to move forward with, with those districts. And that's part of the reason why we say it's a neighborhood self-determination, because it isn't a couple of strong voices. You have to get a, a certain amount of buy-in from a certain percentage of those property owners. In addition to that, in addition to that commissioner, um, because it is a zoning process, the typical protests for 20% to require super majorities. The council would apply, they would come to CPC for the public hearing here, they'd go to council for the, C the public <laughs> hearing there. So it's not just um, a handful of homeowners doing it for a neighborhood. You do need... There is a process. Yes, and, and I can get you those percentages for the historic district, conservation district, and neighborhood stabilization overlays if That's you're interested. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Forsyth, followed by Commissioner Rubin. If I can follow up on Commissioner Hall's uh, uh, questioning about uh, neighborhoods' right to self-determination and your, and your good answers, Patrick, uh, it, is it not fair to say that a neighborhood, uh, you know, is going to be not just a couple of people complaining, but, but it's an organized group? Uh, a neighborhood association or a homeowners association, but most likely a neighborhood association where there is a charter, uh, a set of bylaws that has been established by that neighborhood association. Uh, they, they've probably uh, set up, uh, has a, uh, a, a nonprofit type of organization with the Secretary of State's office and gotten a tax ID number. And they've also, you know, uh, uh, identified themselves as a neighborhood on the Dallas uh, neighborhood uh, neighborhoods map that you you know that that you have with the planning and uh, urban design department right on the map my neighborhoods so those are going to be recognized neighborhoods there's a a fine balancing line between saying yes we want you to be a 501c3 and incorporated with the state but you also don't want the barrier of entry for a neighborhood plan to be so high that you prevent low and moderate income communities from entering that neighborhood because they may they may be very you know they know everybody on their block and they know everybody in the community but there isn't a lawyer that can help them there isn't somebody in the community that can put that paperwork together they they have difficulty raising the 200 or so dollars to, to do that but they have a vision for that community and as long as that vision is equitable and is something that you know from a land use perspective makes sense then that shouldn't prevent the community, the city from working with that community. I agree 100% because, you know, trying to become a 501c3 is almost impossible with the IRS these days. You know, they, they, don't, they consider neighborhoods as being more of a community organization and not a nonprofit organization. Right. I think it's important, too, as we're thinking about it, I think it's a great conversation about what is a neighborhood. So I think a neighborhood isn't just those who live there. There's going to be a neighborhood with businesses and other components that make that that neighborhood actually exist. So I think, um, in terms of self determination, I think the the, the spirit they're trying to get at is 
um, that we are listening to all components of a particular neighborhood, those who live there, those who work there, those who service and, and make that community a community. Uh, we, I think it's, it's probably helpful maybe as we talk about, uh, you know, post forward Dallas, as we start to think about neighborhood plans and what and some areas that need that more granular kind of deep dive of, in terms of land use guidance, helping to define what is a neighborhood, who should be part of this uh, community that that self that's self determining the future. I think that's all questions that you all are bringing up that we need to answer uh, as we think about the next. Uh, stage of you know land use guidance in the city from a neighborhood perspective. So these these are fantastic questions. To be honest, I think we we can provide and think through how to provide bit, bit, a bit more um, clarity on those answers. Because yeah. Mr. Agrew does Please. bring up a very good point. Uh, you, I deal with neighborhood associations on a day to day level, um, and most neighborhood associations are a association of homeowners who live in those neighborhoods. Um, and so to Mr. Goose's point, when we do a neighborhood plan, we want to make sure we are inclusive of not just someone who has lived in those, those homes, but the other individuals, the people that rent in that, those areas, the people that live in a duplex right on the edge of those areas, the people that own businesses in those areas, that those are all neighbors as well. Yeah. Commissioner I Forsyth, certainly appreciate those remarks. I did want to ask one last question on the uh, page three, four on the place type uh, matrix. Under single family attached, you have townhomes, duplexes, and triplexes. Is it, it, uh, it, will you consider removing triplexes? Because that's another crawl in the throat of the of the of the folks in the single family neighborhoods. Because that you, really should be covered under multiplexes, less okay. than ten units. Sorry, just for those online you're speaking on the matrix. So I just want to make sure I'm getting to that. All right, and then uh, just to clarify your question with everybody on the matrix, you're looking regarding three, four. Three, four. Uh, this, this right here. Right. So, what, what what was your request or your thought? Just Under single family attached, you have you know listed townhomes, duplexes, and triplexes, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that triplexes fit under a multiplex. And and so I would like to ask yeah. you to consider removing triplexes from single family attached, because that really should fall under multiplexes. I think we can take a look at that, but also understanding when we say townhomes, that could be six total units, because there, again, it, it's, it's, you know, it's the Canyon townhomes that it's a long structure that has one, two, three, four units, and then on the other side, one, two, three, four units, but because they've been, they're single family attached, and so we can remove triplex to that multiplex. Single family attached then, that, that is the concept of, 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 a, of a, an apartment type of complex and a, you know. Those would be for townhomes because it's single family attached. Okay. But again, understanding of the total number, but again, walking down the street, it, yes, yeah, we can look at it though. Okay. Nice, Trevor Ruben. I want to just delve a little bit more into the concept of uh, neighborhood self-determination. Can we go back to that slide? This slide, 28. Um, the phrase that y'all use in, in um, the slide is thoughtful, and I think as you were speaking, Mr. Blades, you used the word equitable neighborhood self-determination, right? And separate and apart from this proposed language for the document, neighborhood self-determination is a, ther a term that gets thrown around, around a lot in land use and zoning discussions. Is that fair to say? Yes. And there's no defined meaning. You know, there's no copyright on the term. Anyone can, can use it, right? Yes. And, and we've seen a variety of causes and uses that, that the term neighborhood self-determination has been used to uh, argue for and against. I'll take, for example, there's a group called the Coalition for Neighborhood Self-Determination, and, you know, one of their big concerns is the co-location of, you know, industrial polluting uses and in residential uses, right? Yes, sir. 
And there are also examples in the history of the city where the phrase, you know, neighborhood self-determination has been used for some, I would say, inequitable and uglier purposes, right? Yes, I would say that neighborhood self-determination has been used in the past to justify red lighting. Mm -hmm. And would deed restrictions in neighborhoods be an example of neighborhood self-determination? Yes, sir. Okay. And some of those, you know, dating back, speak to who can live where and so on and so forth, right? Yes, sir. So when we talk about the term neighborhood self-determination, do we need to be careful to really think about what is, you know, animating animating the use of that term? Yes, that's where, uh, again, um, and I, I don't believe it's in this definition, but in, in talking with Commissioner um, Hall, saying that it's equitable neighborhood self-determination. Because to your point, neighborhood self-determination has been used to further very inequitable policies in Dallas in certain cases. And we want to make sure that we are respectful of equitable neighborhood self-determination. So when a neighborhood comes in and says, why is this factory right next to our neighborhood? We can say, yes, that should be equitable neighborhood self-determination that we can address that. If they say, why, are, why is that duplex and that renter living next to me? I don't like that. That may not be neighborhood, equitable neighborhood self-determination. Right, and I think to add to that too, uh, maybe which is where you're kind of, uh, kind of helping us walk through is that particular term, we could look at maybe other synonyms that say the same exact thing, because sometimes when you read language, depending on its use in the past, it could incur a certain type of uh, thought or feeling. So we can also look into how do we clarify what we're looking for this, but still get the same point across. I think it's incredibly important to protect our neighborhoods from things that are you know, harmful to them 100%. I don't think anyone around this horseshoe disagrees with that. I just think we need to be very careful when we start to use the term neighborhood self-determination because we get into some pretty significant equity issues. Not that it can't be used for, for good, it's just sort of a chameleon of a term that a lot can sort of masquerade under. Commissioner Carpenter, followed by Commissioner Kirsten. I appreciate uh, Commissioner Rubin's comments and okay, I also- we'll go with Commissioner Sherman. Go What's ahead, that? please. Go ahead, we ready to roll? Yeah, go ahead, let's go. Um, and uh, really appreciate Commissioner Hall bringing this up because I, you know, face value self-determination, neighborhood self-determination is a great thing, but when you dive a little deeper, it definitely has a shadow side. And having served on a neighborhood board for years, many years ago, I, I recall us writing letters and there was eight of us and they were writing on behalf of East Kessler Park and I would say, hey, you know, just let's check ourselves here. Have we really pulled the neighborhood? No, we hadn't, and and we had a great, strong community, and um, so I think that happens all the time. And actually, when you really study this, I know many of the the people that serve on on our uh, neighborhood associations, and husband goes on, he serves for three years, and the wife goes on, and she's the president, and then he rolls off, and he's the trade. You look at this; this is a little tribe that's been running things for thirty years. In one sense, that's great; they care. They're contributing. Maybe other people didn't want to do it. I don't want to say that's always a bad thing. But when we talk about neighborhood self-determination and we talk about when people come to the horseshoe and represent their neighborhood, it is a slippery slope. And I know that this dynamic has actually been studied in white papers and in chapters of books that are on land use. And it's like how public policy gets made in this whole thing about neighborhood self-determination. You know, the statistics that they that were thrown out were at any given time, there's only 10% of a neighborhood that's really paying attention to what's going on. And so if you've got a neighborhood of 300 people, there may be 30 people that are really understanding what's going on and there's maybe six people that are serving or eight people on the board. And the other 90% are just assuming that good decisions are being made and they're going about running their life. I think that we need to like keep that fresh in our minds as we continue to see uh, this process evolved by all of these cases that we see. Commissioner Carpenter, uh, Commissioner Kingston. This is moving away from neighborhood self-determination, but um, the question I'm, questions I'm hearing have to do with really the, um, the basics of 
what is the precise significance of a use being determined to be a primary or a supporting use in a, sing in a community residential neighborhood? Because what people are interpreting is that that means that any of those uses can be allowed by right anywhere. So can you add some context here as to, is the thought supposed to be the, some more guidance as to where the proper placement would be, or we, I'll get into the context sensitivity, but, but still, what, what's, the, what's the limitation of being designated a supporting use? So I guess that's a great question. <clears throat> and I think, let me go back to, So, so on this slide, it's kind of two things. So as we define, you know, the primary and supporting uses, you know, the, the primary being the more prevalent, the one that basically plays a role in characterizing it, it's probably going to be the, the land use that's apparent more often. We don't have a percentage to kind of to break that down. But I think going to what you're saying is that having supporting uses in a place type doesn't mean that that land use is allowed in every parcel. It's, it's a supporting use to the primary uh, uses and, and zoning is the tool that determines where specifically things should go. Uh, so as we maybe refine this definition further, we can maybe clarify that just because a supporting use is allowed in a place type, that doesn't mean it's allowed to go in every parcel. Um, so I think thinking about that, maybe hold that, that kind of helps address what you're looking at because it's kind of like a, a suite of ingredients just because you, you kind of purchase those ingredients doesn't mean it, it should go in every component of the recipe. So we can maybe tweak and, and clarify that here, but we don't have a percentage, we don't have a breakdown because each community is gonna be different depending on where you are. But the, the focus is again more guidance that the predominant prevalent use should be whatever the primary use is and the supporting use helps with just supporting that primary use uh, in general. So we don't have a breakdown of percentages for that. I guess that. the question would become then what would be the mechanism for, for that sort of uh, decision making? Because you know people are used to right now, if it's straight zoning, you're allowed, these are the uses you can do by right, and there isn't really any limitation. I mean, if, if it's the parcel zoned a certain way and the use is allowed, it can just be there, so. I think so, maybe going back to maybe how this guidance document would be used. So say for example, you have an area designated community residential and say a zoning case comes in for changing the entire zoning to, to just say um, something that's more, uh, that's denser in nature, that doesn't seem to fall in light or true to the general guidance that this should be a predominant single family neighborhood. If a zoning change comes in and it's contrary to that, that should bring some red flags that, okay, I don't think this is the vision from the, from the community. There might be some other criteria that helps to, to to tweak what that looks like, but from the general standpoint, if a zoning change comes in and it doesn't seem to be the predominant land use in a, in a larger community, um, that should provide some red flags. So again, we don't have a percentage, but it's more guidance when you do see those uh, zoning change applications looking to change a community at large, uh, that should help to identify that piece. Secondly, if you start to look at maybe piecemeal zoning changes that come in through the market, uh, as you start to see more and more uh, request to change that primary use to something that's more supporting, the community might want that. That might be where we need to go and amend the plan document to reflect uh, more current uh, future guidance. So even though that you could start seeing um, development or zoning changes that could be more focused on the supporting use, that could be what the community wants. But I think here we want to clearly say that this guidance is to show that this is predominantly single family, it's predominantly uh, to maintain the character that you see in single family neighborhoods, and you will see uh, in different components and areas other supporting uses, you know, not just other single family attached, but you could see other supporting commercial, other mixed use to help to support and make that community what it is. But again, um, if there is direction for a community to change that land use to something else based on the market and the community, we would need to go back and change this guidance here as well. And what we talked about at CLUP um, is for those supporting land uses, are there conditional statements in Ford Dallas that would provide that guidance? And so you can say in community residential, uh, a multiplex 
or a apartment building is a supporting land use? Are there conditions in this place type that say, yes, it could happen here, here are those conditions, it's got to be along a major street, or it's got to be close to an activity center. Um, at CLUP, um, I, I think because there was a diversity of opinions on whether or not to include those, um, those conditions, they weren't included. Um, but if there are opinions here from CPC that would help y'all make those determinations when the cases come before y'all, then this is the opportunity to have that discussion. Commissioner Kingston. So this weekend, Frankie, <clears throat> my nickname for my reconstructed thrice times ankle, and I took a little walk around my neighborhood that was predominantly built in the 19 teens through the 1930s. And I was specifically taking photographs of existing missing middle. And what I, because I knew it was there, <clears throat> two doors down is a sixplex that was built in the 20s, 1920s. Um, right behind me is a threeplex with a garage apartment that was built in the 1920s. Um, farther down that block is a craftsman bungalow that has been reconstructed into a sixplex with a garage apartment. So that's seven units that sits um, in the middle of the block next to a bungalow on one side and a, a new constructed house on the other. The other direction, there's an eightplex that I think was probably built in the 1980s, so it's not original construction. But my point is that all of these types of housing, for the most part, are historic. And my neighborhood is not different than neighborhoods like it from all over the city. And so when I take a look at what we should be calling either supporting or primary types, I don't, I don't agree that we should take out single family attached townhome duplex and triplex or smaller, you know, multifamily of fewer than 10 from community residential because I think it's been there for 100 years. And, it, and so I do, to one of the points, you know, Commissioner Rubin made earlier, I think a lot of the objection is to the form of what's getting built. And I think there's a lot of work that we could do on that, and I have some ideas on how to attack that. But I don't think that necessarily the existence of some of this is what the issue is. And so I want to, and also to, to Commissioner Chernock's point, if we just take all of this out, what are we doing? I mean, I got a lot of stuff I could be doing today. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going to advance the ball, then what are we doing here? And taking all of this stuff out so we essentially just have 40% of the city's land, a single family that is increasingly unattainable to an increasing number of the population, we're just setting ourselves up to fail as a city. I mean, I. I keep saying this, and I know it falls on deaf ears for a lot of people who are the loudest opponents of this plan. My generation is the last generation who, in mass, are going to be able to afford single-family homes in places like Dallas, and even a lot of them struggle. And generations behind me are really struggling to be able to afford these homes. And so if we don't start doing things differently, we're foreclosing that opportunity for all of the generations behind me. And so I think we have to think about that when we're making some of these decisions. Thank you. Commissioner Rubin. Yeah, I uh, wholeheartedly agree <laughs> with what Commissioner Kingston said. C circling back around to the primary use, supporting use distinction, and sitting at club for God knows how many meetings, one of the things that I think was a uh, key component of our discussions at CLOP, separate and apart from even the, the residential place types, was just because something is a primary use 
in a place type doesn't mean that it is, you know, carte blanche for the entire place type. We'll take the example of sort of the flex commercial, which we really struggled with. You know, we're not saying that the most intense end of a flex commercial is blessed throughout flex commercial. We're saying it, it makes sense in part, but it's still a primary land use. So, you know, I think locational language rather than maybe, you know, tinkering with primary versus supporting and design standard language may be the key to, you know, harmonizing missing middle with within the community residential place type. Commissioner Blair, followed by Commissioner Carpenter. Now, some of you guys are going to be really, really excited I say this. Listening to all this and understanding where my community sits, looking at the demographics, looking at the age, looking at it all, I understand um, Commissioner Kingston's point of view, and I understand some of what some of the other you, of you guys have been saying. There has to be a balance. We do need to take this ball and roll it on down the hill, or up the hill, or whatever hill it is, up, down, or between the hills. Um, and I get that. But I also understand that some of, uh, some of us speak from where their, their, their community is sitting. And some of the communities don't sit in the same box that others sit in. So the, the challenge then becomes, are we speaking from the hearts of our community or are we speaking from what is logical and reasonable. As you guys all know, I'm the only district that has a community that lives on farmland, likes farmland, refuses to give up their farmland, and it's not equitable, may I said it, it's not equitable as a city that is trying to grow to maintain that type of lifestyle. But you can't, I cannot just take them all and tell them you got to go somewhere else. There's cows, there's horses, there's chicken, there are pigs, there whatever they are down there. And they are thriving. Um, so, and, and to move this ball down the road, I think what we're doing is trying to, deal, to dig down too deep, and we need to bring it back up a little bit to say this is not per unit because we have some cold issues that need to be addressed that we're trying to make be addressed in Fort Dallas, and that's not what Fort Dallas is. Fort Dallas is a helicopter approach to the whole entire city that says, this is what I think we could get to, but this is not what I have to do. So when we, so when, and, and, and I sat on a homeowners association for years until I wanted to, and it's not an easy place to sit. And we can't put, and, 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 and neighborhood self-determination is like let's sitting on a neighborhood association, a HOA, or, or whatever. And it's only as good as it's written today. We all have some, some of those, and they have been, there's some that are decades old maybe 40, 50 years old, um, that, that says, this is the way I want my community to, to look. There are some that, like I have that are 20 years old that said it needs to be updated and I can't get it updated because the process is too convoluted and too hard to get through, get, get it to the top so it has some traction. 
So the question now for me is, do I take this plan and, and I agree, we have TODs, we have sitting in the middle of old neighborhoods that are sitting in, in, in the middle where communities feel that their single family housing that's on an R75 should be the smallest lot. And if it's on a TOD, by virtue of the fact that the, the definition of a TOD, as we understand it, says it should be high density, it should be townhouses, duplexes, multifamily, yeah, 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 high, with, that's high, and, I, and you're sitting with, with right next to a community that says, that's not what I want. Where um, Commissioner Kingston, has the missing middle all over the place, I, my, commu my community would say that's totally unacceptable. So when we're saying missing middle, we should be able to say in this plan that the missing middle is this, highest end definition, saying that in this particular community, it would be suggested that it sits here like this, opposed to saying, opposed to believing that we're as a body gonna take the missing middle, put it in the middle of, an, of a block in a community that doesn't want it and tell that community that because we need it, you have to accept it, but to say that it may be appropriate in, in an older community that's on a corner, on a, on a, where it is, the, where the design standards are easily accepting of this new type, of this new type, of, or it's not a new type of development, of this type of development that is, a, that, that helps the city grow. We will be here until next year if we don't bring it up and, and say this is a concept and an ideal, not a definitive definition and approach as to what we have to do in any given community or any given place type because in in the community residential, which is most of my district, from what you guys are all telling, I, or, and, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I have one TOD, I have all, most of community residential, and I have all of the, the historical land, the farmland that we could have. So I have the outlier of the whole entire city. My, my, my district does not fit in any, in, in order to, to, to bring this to the next level, you'd have to build a whole entire plan just for District 8, and that's unreasonable. So what I'm saying is that hearing what everybody else is saying, I agree, I, believe it or not, I agree with Ruben. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I agree with... This meeting with, is being recorded. <laughs> I agree in, into a certain... I, I agree with what he's saying that... And I agree with, 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 um, with Commissioner Chernock. I agree with Commissioner... Hall. I agree with what everybody is saying to a degree as to how we need to grow but I'm not agreeing with how we are saying it should be written. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carpenter, followed by Commissioner Rubin, followed did by I Commissioner say Forsyth. Right? Did, I, did, I, did I help you out? 100%, so I think what I was gonna say is that you, think, you mentioned three things that I thought were very critical. One, this guiding document is very, is overarching. Uh, it's, it doesn't provide as much detail uh, for every community, but I think one thing that um, you're kind of driving home to is that this document in and of itself 
isn't going to provide that guidance. This document, plus your knowledge of the community, plus the community as well, those are we're adding an additional layer of kind of feedback and guidance for when you do see zoning changes in your community, you know exactly what needs to happen based on your conversations. And this just provides another layer of, of guidance for that. So I think everything you mentioned was spot on. I have anything else to add. I uh, just wanted to say that this is another component, another layer for you to have to help with those decisions um, as you uh, go through what you're doing on, on this board. Okay, Commissioner Carpenter, Reuben, Forsyth, and Hampton, then we'll take our break. Oh, wow, I lit up the yeah. whole, I done lit up the whole, law firm. I done lit up the whole entire. Law firm. Uh, I wanna talk about context sensitivity, because I, I think context sensitivity is really going, uh, some mechanisms for ensuring context sensitivity are going to be absolutely crucial to getting neighborhoods to accept missing middle. Um, because I think some of the, um, the anger that we're getting about this new construction going in in these neighborhoods has to do with what is enabled by the current straight zoning. That, you know, we get zoning cases on a regular basis at CPC that are asking us to do one, one lot up zonings. And, you know, the question of context sensitivity comes up and staff has, has basically, I mean, the, the conclusion I have drawn is that they, they think that block face continuity is is what can be achieved at this point. But, you know, we've all seen the ugly duplexes that, you know, with the whether it's the parking code or what the developer wants to develop in terms of, you know, maximizing the square footage, there's just, it, it really is going to have to be a priority or, or language going to have to be strengthened somehow, I think, if you're going to get any acceptance at all. Because, I mean, I'm familiar with the neighborhoods in D14 and, say, Kings Highway and District 1. You know, they're beautiful neighborhoods that, that you know, have different types of density and they respect the, um, you know, the surroundings. But then we have other neighborhoods where developers don't show that much um, appreciation for the existing character of the neighborhood. And I'm going to segue on to you know, the NSO, you know, a lot of neighborhoods don't have the architectural or the historic significance to even think about getting one of those districts. And the way the neighborhood stabilization overlay is written, you know, there are just three criteria, the uh, front yard setback, the height, and the garage placement that, you know, drive whether or not a neighborhood is able to do that. And I know East Kessler tried, looked at doing that um, process and I know my neighborhood Western Heights did the same and we weren't eligible largely because of the topography in our neighborhoods that dictate you know that some houses on top of a hill somewhere at the bottom. we just didn't meet the criteria so I think it would help a great deal if if the city were to look at coming up with some sort of um, a variant on the neighborhood stabilization overlay maybe a neighborhood character overlay or something that that work toward context sensitivity in these neighborhoods that don't have the, the high degree of architectural and historic significance. And maybe it could be as simple as, you know, the way height is measured or the lot coverage and, and that sort of thing. But I, I just see a lot of resistance to this con the concept of adopting missing middle in these neighborhoods if we don't really address the context sensitivity issue. Yes, ma'am. It's or sorry, Commissioner. Um, it is a, a very good point. You know, on a R75 lot, you can build a 6,000 square foot structure, two story structure that because of how we measure height can be 40, 45 feet tall um, that has one single family dwelling unit in it. And it might be next to a 15 foot tall, 2,000 square foot duplex that was built years ago. And one is out of context with the, the, the community, but it's not the missing middle. It's the gigantic single family home. So yes, uh, in the implementation section, we do have um, items in there that, ex that talk about exploring additional tools to help address the context sensitivity of new housing that's being built in our communities. And all that is on the agenda. It's, it's coming our way, Commissioner. Vice Chair Ruben. Yeah, first off, I um, really look forward to seeing the potential for a options to make the NSO more, a more robust tool um, in the, the near future. Um, just providing a little bit of color from some of our discussions or many discussions at CLUP, 
you know, one of the things that we really struggled with and going to Commissioner Blair's point and, you know, I know Commissioner Herbert has a fair amount of ag land or, you know, transitioning ag land too. <laughs> I'm thinking of all that Mountain Creek area and some of the fun zoning cases we had there amongst other places. Can you speak to how we develop the small town residential place type and what that is, is aimed at? Yeah, good, good question. So in terms of our development with uh, CLUP, so uh, the small town feel, that was a, a topic that was brought up from initial community engagement that uh, the community still wanted to have some type of connection or have four Dallas connect to um, small town residential feel somewhere in the document. So initially it came up as a theme um, in the document, but as we look at the entire city, um, it's actually locational specific. Uh, like we mentioned, District 8 and other areas that used to be in District 3 but was actually transitioning to something else. Uh, so the, the concept of kind of keeping that small town feel was transitioned from a theme to a place type. And that place type starts to embody a lot of those characteristics that uh, Commissioner Blair mentioned. So that's kind of how we've kind of uh, used the community feedback in terms of they still wanted to have some connection to that type of lifestyle. Uh, it was initially brought up as a theme, but it kind of transitioned more to a place type, and that place type is specific to the districts you just mentioned. Is there anything else you want to provide feedback on, on that too as well? Well, and part of it uh, came up because, um, and as um, on the commission, you see these almost every, every two weeks, people taking property that doesn't have a current land use on it, has, a, has um, ag zoning on it, and they want to do commercial motor vehicle parking, or they want to build a giant warehouse. Um, and part of what, and again, I know we're talking about community residential, but part of what Ford Dallas is meant to do is to create a vision to say, no, just because it has ag zoning on it doesn't mean that you can go ahead and submit anything you want. The community, and you know, over in Mountain Creek, a lot of those community members have come together to say, we understand it's not going to be a field anymore, but we don't want it to be a warehouse. This is a place where we want to build more housing. In some cases, they say yes, it should be more dense and you know a, a compact neighborhood. Sometimes they said no, we like the, the 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 smaller town residential feel, and so creating that place type and then being able to put that on a map so that you're providing that guidance for city staff, for CPC, for council, and for developers to say no, we've already said we don't want this type of development here, but it's an opportunity in many of the in, in really in, in both the three and eight to develop new housing that's generally speaking more single family housing. Yeah, I appreciate that kind of reminder that when we look at three and eight, uh, so you're, you both deal with the industrial kind of warehouse issue. Um, more in three was more, we want to have more of a mix of uses in our area. And in district eight was more, we want to maintain some of the small town feel, but also to look at that mix of uses and maintain our community. So I think that, that component that you mentioned looks a bit different in your districts, but that's kind of how it, it kind of came up to what it is. Um, another point of really important club color that I think is, is important to, um, you know, bring up for the, the plan commission is that we started off with, we sort of, we started off with two pretty similar residential place types. There was a traditional residential place type and a blended residential place type. And I think one of the big concerns with, with that division was the equity of that because it seemed to, even though they were very similar, people got the impression that we were saying some neighborhoods should be in the discussion for missing middle, other neighborhoods should be exempted from that discussion. Can you speak to that? Yes, uh, Vice Chair, um, very well articulated. We had uh, two very similar, we had a small town residential place type and we had a city residential place type. And then we had two others um, that um, were mainly a single family residential place type. But one were older neighborhoods, um, neighborhoods that are closer to downtown Dallas. And the other one were neighborhoods that were further away from downtown Dallas. Um, and when you have those two different place types, uh, to the vice chair's point, there is the either very real or just perceived inequity that would occur when you're labeling those as different place types. 
Um, I, I know CLEPS um, talked about it at length. I know city staff worked about it at, at length to understand that one of, one of we, we, we couldn't have two of those place types because then you are potentially highlighting one of them as opposed to the other one for more development versus the other. And so it's, it's making sure that from a land use perspective, and it's only the land use perspective, but both of those communities, whether you're closer to downtown or further away from downtown, both of those neighborhoods would have the same land use guidance that we're treating them in equitable manner as opposed to an inequitable manner. And also for consistency for the rest of the document, other place types dealt with different forms of that land use composition within the place type. Uh, you know, this was the first draft of the plan, so we, we, what we should have done was have it together initially and talk about the different forms in there. So this also, from just how the plan document is structured, just makes uh, this place type consistent with how the other place types are defining uh, those types of land uses in the document. And was, would it be fair to say that one of CLUP's significant concerns is that we, you know, make sure that, that all parts of the city of Dallas are continuing to participate in the conversation about how to meet our, our housing needs. And we don't let certain neighborhoods, particularly, you know, if you look, you know, historically some neighborhoods have really had veto power, whereas other neighborhoods have had things dumped on them based on where they are in town and who lives in them. But this plan is supposed to keep all neighborhoods in the continuing conversation about how we meet our housing needs and not exempt anyone from a conversation about missing middle, recognizing that there can be various decisions made throughout the city keeping our equity goals in mind. Um, I believe you asked if that was CLEP's uh, vision. I think as the chair of CLEP, you probably articulated it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know there were 20 plus meetings and I don't expect everyone to have watched one if, if, if not all 20. So I just wanted to make sure that point came through. Um, one last question that I have is we've gotten some correspondence from concerned members of the community saying we shouldn't, you know, discuss adding housing to existing neighborhoods. The way to tackle our housing shortage, whatever housing, X, Y, Z, whatever you want to label it, is we need to go all in on transit-oriented development. And some people may say mixed-use redevelopment along corridors and shopping centers as well. Why not, why, why is that not the way that this document goes? Why are, are neighborhoods part of this discussion about how we meet our housing needs. No, great thought. So um, going back to TOD, for example, that's actually recommendations in the current four Dallas right now. So that's, that's an initiative that's being pushed, that's being developed, and that's part of city policy. So in addition to that, we have to look at, okay, in addition to that type of policy, which is gonna be uh, uh, magnified and, and exemplified within four Dallas, how do we, uh, think about how can other people own land in the city. So when we talk about TODs, typically that's focused on renting uh, or kind of that kind of density. You could have condos too, too as well, but we have to think about from a citywide perspective, you know, going back to the initial data that we showed uh, with, if we keep the land composition the way it is, we could become the San Diego, like that could happen, but it's gonna be a different composition of people that live here if we wanna maintain that composition and being able to kind of get the taxes that we need from there. So in, in addition to the TOD, which is still part of the current uh, policy with 4 Dallas 06, uh, we have to look at how land uses throughout the entirety of the city uh, can be um, more efficient in terms of kind of providing affordable housing uh, for the city. Is it fair to say that there are different timelines for developing TODs and redeveloping shopping centers and, and commercial you know, corridors for mixed use versus some of this missing middle? And are there different development pressures and considerations? So you know, maybe TODs and mixed use redevelopment are, you know, aren't the only way we can tackle this most efficiently? Right, in terms of timeline, I wouldn't be able to say kind of what's the, the focus. I think the market's going to kind of help with, with that. But I think in terms of what we're looking to do is, as we look at corridors and TODs, like some of those errors are, 
aren't as efficient or not as um, productive in terms of what it's developing. So looking at how do we add more land uses, mix of uses and availability for the market to, to drive development, that's one component, um, one way we're looking at it through Forward Dallas. Uh, but from the timeline perspective, I'm, I'm not sure if I have an answer to, for that one. Yeah, and going back to a question that Commissioner Forsythe, uh, Forsythe asked as well, um, yes, our Forward Dallas does talk about adding housing in TOD. It's the, the very first recommendation in um, the implementation guides talks about prioritizing adding TOD. And Forward Dallas talks about adding housing um, along corridors. Um, but not everybody wants to live next to a train station. Not everybody wants to live in a six-story tall apartment building. Some folks want to live in and around our neighborhoods and communities and they don't have those opportunities now. And so part of that missing middle is figuring out ways to provide some of that housing, a little bit of that housing in those neighborhoods for the people that do want to live there that, as Commissioner Kingston pointed out, are, have been wildly priced out um, by you know, just, just the market and older generations. Right. I think a, a community, fee, uh, uh, part of the community that they mentioned to us too, like why do I have to go to a train station? Why can't I get the, the mix of uses in my current neighborhood. We hear that too as well. And although they're not the loudest in terms of what we've heard in the community, through the last few years, we've heard that a lot in terms of those who are maybe in current single family neighborhoods that want that mix of use, that want to be able to walk to a grocery store or want to be able to if downsize, like in my neighbors, uh, single family, they're older, they would love to stay in their community, uh, but because they can't, they're gonna be moving out to another part of the community where there's a mix of uses where they can walk to what they need to do because they're getting older, they can't drive. So those are things we're hearing too as well is that that missing middle is something that's lacking. I think the percentage here was what point or 2%. Uh, so having more of that in these communities and all communities is something that's desired. Uh, we don't have that, that's needed. Uh, so as the population ages and other communities come in, we have to think about how do we provide those options or suite of options uh, to keep people in the city and also to, to develop and to grow those cities as more people come into the, the city limits. Yeah, and, and just one last thing on, on the TOD. Um, if you're looking to develop housing in an equitable manner, um, there are a lot of areas of Dallas that, that don't, wouldn't have TOD. Um, and so if we're just gonna say TOD, well then there are a lot of areas of Dallas that we wouldn't build any more housing in because they don't have TOD possibilities. Great, thank you guys so much. Commissioner Forsythe. I'd like to, if you don't mind, let Commissioner Sleeper go before me because he hasn't had the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so, uh, if you if you will, I'd like to give him the next. Uh, sure, the next please. Very generous of you, Mr. Forsyth. I appreciate that. Um, it, it seems to me that the that the problem we're trying to tackle is it costs a certain amount of money to run the city, provide fire and police, all the different services the city has to provide. And if we don't grow our tax base, the only option is we gotta keep raising the taxes and raising the taxes and nobody's gonna like that. So we talk about attacking, uh, attacking that through one of, the, one of the things being to um, go into neighborhoods and create duplexes, triplexes where single family zoning existed and that that creates more um, opportunity for, for middle income housing. But, and that may or may not be true. I, I don't hear a lot of buy-in on that in the communities. When I go out and listen to people from the neighborhoods talk, they say, well, yeah, but we really don't want that. Well, the rationale isn't so much whether or not everybody wants that in their neighborhood, it's that we need to densify or we just can't afford to operate the city. And you look at some of these other cities that have those problems, I think they're suffering under that. So the question is, how do we equitably add density in a way that doesn't unfairly gouge any particular community? And I, I think what your plan is recommending, it's saying that everybody needs to participate in this a little bit. We need some densification, even in neighborhoods where they, do, where they really don't want more density. I don't think we're, we're doing a good job of selling why we need more density. But the reason we need it is because we need to raise our tax base. 
and I'm not sure that we do enough sometimes to um, properly um, endorse those areas where we're seeking to build a lot more density and, and really raise the tax base and probably the benefit that, that community is paying in versus the cost of providing the services is a lot less. The more, I mean, I, it doesn't cost that much more to provide services in an area like Uptown where we have the, the tax base and then there is extraordinarily high but uh, the cost of providing services there, I mean, I think we underserve that community uh, by the way uh, the city doles out its services. But anyway, the, I guess the, the point I'm making is that I don't feel like there has been an effective do job of helping people understand why it's important to do this densification. It's not just adding density because if we do that, it's going to, it's going to provide more middle income housing. Well, it may or may not. I mean, some of these homes, if they get redeveloped, they're not necessarily going to be cheap. Some of them are going to still be expensive. But it, it's more the idea of, of sharing that load and then the burden we're going to have to pay if we don't densify. Thank you. Spoken 100% and clearly I don't have anything to add to that. I'll just say uh, from, from staff's perspective, we are acknowledging that too and hopefully through future presentations that we have in communities is kind of setting up the table in terms of where we are, showing the data, the rationale behind why we're looking at it from a citywide perspective, and to touch on what you just mentioned too, so 100%. Mr. Okay. Forsyth. I'm glad I gave you the opportunity to go first, uh, Commissioner Sleeper. The, the single family uh, 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 detached, uh, you know, uh, place type, our, our, our land use on your place type matrix map, you indicated in your uh, statistics earlier it was 34% of the city, right? In terms of land mass? Correct. Okay. So I think that the folks who are in these single family attached neighborhoods or detached neighborhoods, forgive me, uh, the single family neighborhoods that I represent, I think we've compromised. You know, we, we, we're, we're going along with you including us in the community residential place type. You know, I think you, you've heard from uh, a number of folks saying that, hey, they would rather have a separate single family place type. And, and considering it's 34% of the land mass, I, I, I think that's not an unreasonable request to make. So we compromise and we put it in with community residential. That's fine. What we're asking for is what Commissioner Blair said, we don't want you to start plopping multiplexes in the middle of a single family residential neighborhood. And as long as you give us that assurance, then we'll go along with this compromise. And that's what you've tried to do, and I compliment you for that. I compliment you for listening to the neighbors at the town halls that we've had and for saying, hey, you know what, you've got a legitimate concern here. And we're going to address it. We're going to address it by saying that multiplexes are a supporting land use and not a primary land use. We're going to address it by saying that, yes, density is good, but it's better when it's in these corridors. You know, uh, you know, and you've addressed it also by saying that, hey, you know, we're not going to, you know, do anything that encourages on-street parking in our residential neighborhoods. So uh, I, uh, I, I, just, just to want to say that if we want to pass this plan, the folks who are for development and the folks who are for the communities need to compromise and work together. And you're, make, you're forging that trail here today. And I hope everyone on this commission will respect you and listen to you and value your input that you've given us today and incorporate that into the final plan because I think that's a plan we can all support. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was able to catch some of the discussion um, online, and I will apologize if I'm repeating some things that have either been asked or um, observations made, but I think one of the things that I've heard pretty consistently, and I, sim similar to m others who have spoken, live in a neighborhood that has duplexes, 
I live directly behind a multi-unit apartment building. It's probably 20 plus units. I, I think there's a lot of our areas that have the things that this plan is trying to speak to. What I am hearing in a lot of the feedback is while we're talking about creating those neighborhoods more broadly, more equitably, we've got those tools. I mean, we, we have clearly learned how we took, because my neighborhood started out when it was originally built, 100% single family, it has evolved over time. How are we integrating those tools that have helped keep neighborhoods stable while allowing for this diversification in housing types, choice, whatever words we end up using? And one thing that I think, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit at our last meeting, having the full list of the glossary and the definitions. I think having additional context within our place types. It may be, we need another page. I, you know, I don't know exactly how we get there, but layering in some of these items that have been talked about today, that have been talked about at our other meetings, seems to me one way that we start answering those questions. And again, not all the tools that we used 10 years ago, 20 years ago, are appropriate or should even be part of this, but at least looking at them and seeing where are the other new opportunities that we have and how do we start putting those in here. I, I think the other significant concern, and I think it hopefully can be partly addressed as we talk about this, is that the neighborhoods who have gone through this are saying, look, we understand they're not attainable anymore, but we there's going to be further pressure that existing residents and future residents won't be able to be within their communities. Folks who've lived there for 30 years, it's great that they have the opportunity to take advantage of that wealth building, but they don't have anywhere. They're, the concern is they won't have anywhere within our community, in our city, in the future. And that's where I think trying to get some of this additional context would just help advance the conversation. So again, I, I will apologize, but and, and if this was already asked or answered, do we know when we're getting get some of those, uh, you know, the drafts and the appendixes and the other pieces that need to be part of a full evaluation of the document? Yes. So based on kind of the feedback that we're getting from these workshops and previous uh, workshops, what we want to do is probably after um, this week or next week, it starts to basically compile that to so just a completed version for you all in the public to see. I think some of the comments that we heard initially was that uh, just just that just the main plan document was, oh, this is too massive. This is too much information to sift through. So um, adding more to that, I think for some community members, was just uh, it was too much. But I think it's important to see the, the context, see what the plan is saying in context to the glossary and, and all that. So that's going to be the plan document. You know, typically these documents um, are 700 pages. We didn't want to be close to that, so I think with the appendices and all that it might be several hundred pages. That's still pretty uh, palatable. So that's, that's going to be something that we develop uh, post th these discussions, uh, and hopefully within by the end of the month is to have that packaged for the community to see the updates that you all have provided and we talked through in addition to the glossary and the appendices uh, packaged in one place. So yes. And then one follow-up question related to that is, I know we talked a lot about how we're layering in existing historic districts, existing conservation districts. I, I know there's concern, you know, you get too much data and their information becomes unusable. Um, but how we are thinking about area plans that are still relevant and how those are acknowledged and integrated. And usually those area plans are then in existing plan development districts. And again, just what that language is going to be um, to give folks some you know, understanding of how that's going to move forward in the future. And if I've missed language update on that, please direct me. That would be fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I have to answer that. So I think within the plan document, within the introduction, we actually touch on how current area plans are, are were and how they're going to be incorporated into the document. So I'm just going to look at I'm going to read verbatim from our relationship of, to other plans. Uh, Fort Dallas 2.0 is part of a suite of citywide adopted suite of citywide adopted plans that should be used in concert to advance city goals. It also provides overarching context and guidance for smaller area planning efforts, including future neighborhood and corridor plans, smaller area plans with land use components prior to 2006. Fort Dallas 
are superseded by this plan. More recent plans that are adopted into this comprehensive plan by reference, however, uh, policies in this plan supersede any policies that are in conflict with those previously adopted plans. Uh, future area plans that are adopted after Fort Dallas uh, so after the adoption of four Dallas will be incorporated as amendments to the components of four Dallas 2.0. So the idea is that just in general, a lot of words. So those previous plans that exist in the city, those were used to develop the, the land use plan and the map. Uh, we went to the community, we, we, sh we shopped around those current drafts and they, and we said, okay, based on your current plan is on the ground. Does the four Dallas map and plan reflect that? Uh, so we've gotten the feedback through iterations of the plan. We've provided an updated uh, map. Uh, secondly, as we look at um, those plans, they still provide more detail from other components of what communities would like to see in their area. The land use component is what's in for Dallas, but the other more detailed components of those plans are going to still uh, be what guides those small communities. And then when we look into the, the future of the neighborhood planning com component of uh, what happens post for Dallas, uh, I think Patrick can elaborate on how that's going to be integrated with that new, uh, that new process. So. Not every area plan. Um, so what Lawrence said, when we have a neighborhood or an area plan that provides more detail than forward Dallas that's currently on the books, um, we're gonna look, just like the historical districts, we, we look to that neighborhood or area plan for that additional guidance. Unless that neighborhood or area plan provided guidance that is in conflict with forward Dallas. There are some adopted neighborhood and area plans um, more so referencing industrial areas that make recommendations that they stay in industrial areas that for Dallas is saying, no, they should move away from industrial areas. So if there is a conflict between that neighborhood plan and that area plan in for Dallas, you would look for for Dallas for that. If there is no conflict, and we said this should be community residential, you know, in a larger area or community mixed use, and there's more granular detail about this street versus that street, then you would move ahead with that area plan or that neighborhood plan. Um, I can say I, I don't believe there are instances in which you're going to have that conflict outside of the industrial places. That's the, that's the conflict that we have, that there are some area plans that are adopted that say this should remain industrial, that now Forward Dallas is saying, no, this should be community mixed use or, or, or flex commercial space. So that, I, that's, I, that, sorry, go ahead. No, thank you for that and for the commissioners who didn't hear it all. That's on page 1.5 of our draft. Um, and I think it's the use of the word superseded where I absolutely hear you that there's locations where that's probably the correct language. I think there are communities that I'm hearing from that that word is giving them very great concern that there are going to be unanticipated changes that they've put a lot of time in, that they are down here regularly advocating for our, this body and our council to support those neighborhoods. And so, um, again, it, I just I feel like whether it's through that language or to how we look at the appendices and existing conditions and defining areas, right. because the map, and I get it, the map's up here. The area plans are down, you know, below there. <laughs> it's just there's a lot of detail in detail that communities are relying on that Again, I'll use an example. They already have single family and duplex defined. It's probably a 50% mix. If we start changing that mix further, how is the neighborhood and its evolution insured? So right, no, that's a great point. I wanna, I wanna kind of touch on that a bit. So as we look at those area plans that exist now, uh, you, you have a community that maybe in your district that says we're a residential community. You can go to D district eight and they can say, residential community, those differences, uh, even though on the surface level they say the same thing, they mean different things. So I think when we, looking from Fort Dallas, we want to basically start from the overarching high level and then when you get to that more detailed kind of granular piece, uh, your those area plans, um, if needed, will provide that, that more specific guidance. But I think just to go, kind of go back to what we did, we used those as a baseline when we went out, when we went out to communities. Um, to kind of create what the general guidance is. Uh, some of those plans still provide more, more detail, so those would still help uh, with those communities in terms of 
land use breakdown or et cetera. Uh, but that was just to help us build the general uh, baseline with Fort Dallas. I hear you. I will express that the map does not always fully reflect that and it has been repeatedly observed. So hopefully with the latest draft, we'll get some of that cleaned up and add context where needed. Right, and there any tweaks on the map, we can also talk about that offline. So I, I am very familiar with one very specific tweak um, that, um, yes, yes, we, we have sat down many times to make sure that one is tweaked, yes. Tweaks are good. Commissioner, it's 12.58. Let's go ahead and take our lunch break. We do have a, a working lunch, so let's be back online at 12.20. It's 12.34. We are back to you, gentlemen. <clears throat> all right, thank you all so much. Uh, so for the second half of our meeting, we are going to discuss the implementation component of the plan. So for those who brought your document with you, that is section 4-4 or page 4-4. And what we're gonna do first is just open up the, the, the conversation for each of those theme sections, just to talk through any comments you have specifically to that. Uh, we'll, what our team will do afterwards is provide um, updates um, from a development standpoint for what uh, the, the project team is doing on the implementation section. And then hopefully your feedback, our updates, uh, hopefully covers uh, what we wanna talk about today. And then if we have time, we'll provide uh, comments on other parts of the document and how we're updating that. And also talk through uh, the schedule uh, just to see if there's any other tweaks that we need to make on, on our scheduling for reviewing this plan document. So give me a second, let me get this uh, started on the screen and we can begin our conversation. All right, cool deal. So uh, to begin our conversation, what we're gonna do, uh, we'll give a, give a quick overview for those who are just tuning in and, uh, um, with this review. Uh, what we wanna do is delve into the implementation section of this plan. And this particular section uh, delves into how we're gonna be implementing some of the, the goals and objectives uh, that were sought through or discussed uh, from the earlier sections of the plan and trying to see one, if those action steps of those items make sense in terms of what it says, who's leading the key partners, et cetera. And then if you all have any additional either action items or language tweaks to each of those sections. So it's gonna be more of a kind of textual review on this side of our discussion today. Just going from first the environmental justice implementation table. We'll give some time just to look at the document uh, look at the 14 action steps. I'm gonna give a quick overview with the objectives, high level, and then we can do a deep dive into the, the action steps that you all might uh, request that we look into further or tweak the ones that we have on, on the document. So uh, there are three objectives just based on the, the feedback from the theme section. Uh, a, to support a citywide environmental justice, uh, the, the support citywide environmental justice goals uh, two, mitigate negative environmental impacts from new development. And three, support the environmental protection of key natural assets. So those are the three objectives that came from uh, the environmental justice and sustainability theme. And if uh, looking through the action steps within that particular section, if y'all have any specific um, either questions, concerns, or additions to this table. Uh, this is kind of what we want to just to kind of engage your feedback because the implementation section is going to be what gets implemented at action items. You all might be part of um, implementing that within this horseshoe. So we want to make sure that the language here uh, is is uh, enforceable or can be act, uh, can be implemented. And if you have any other feedback in terms of how we're structuring this, we can do that too as well.
Commissioner Carpenter. <laughs> Sorry, I have to swallow here. Um, on number three, you have utilized the forward Dallas environmental justice areas of focus analysis. What's the status of that? Yeah, okay, great question. So as part of um, the work that our consultants helping us um, develop is um, identifying focus areas based on each of these themes. So each of these themes have uh, certain metrics that were developed from our existing conditions report. So for example, looking at uh, air pollution or uh, tree canopy coverage, they're overlaying those layers to create uh, kind of a focus for each of these themes. Um, what we hope to do is that that will be something that we either build upon post for Dallas or depending on uh, the feedback from this team, um, sorry, from this committee, is we can provide some updates in terms of what they've done so far. Uh, so the idea is to look at each theme look at the metrics that are relevant to each theme and use those mapping tools to identify focus areas of, of areas of focus that we need to do more intervention or look through uh, if a zoning, um, authorized zoning is needed or if a neighborhood plan is needed in some of those areas. So the idea behind the uh, focus area uh, map is to identify those areas per theme that needs to uh, focus on. Is that going to be included as a, an appendix or something to this document? Yes. So I think right now what we're doing is developing with our consultant, like how to kind of clarify the metrics and apply, apply that. So we want to either include it, uh, depending on the time that we have, either as an appendix, part of the implementation plan, but we want to be able to use that to identify the focus areas that's going to be used um, for, this, for this section of the, of the document. So yes, either in an appendix or a subcomponent of this section. Uh, yes. Of course. Could, I, I see that you've added, um, I guess number 10 is new altogether about monitoring commercial activities emitting air pollution in industrial hub areas and, and regulate to ensure environmental justice policies and strategies are adhered to. Um, what, I, I'm having difficulty seeing how the city is going to add some sort of layer of regulation to what already exists in terms of permitting through TCEQ and such, so can you elaborate a little right. bit Right, so I think what we're thinking about is if it's either done through the OEQS department kind of helping us think through if it's through their, uh, through their tools or if it's more of a zoning um, uh, um, amendment or tweak that we can add to our particular zoning categories that helps to uh, measure and monitor that. So I think the, the reason we added it as, as a new component to discuss, and I'm, brought, I'm glad you brought that up, is if you all have feedback in terms of maybe how we could refine that or tweak that from a land use zoning perspective, we can we can tweak that particular action step. But uh, that's currently that's why it's new, and we're, we're glad to elaborate on how we can refine that further. Last chair, Ruben. Yeah. Um, Two areas that I wanted to focus on. One, uh, following up on Commissioner Carpenter's thoughts on item three, I think it's fantastic that we are developing environmental justice areas of focus and certainly don't want to impede that. At the same time, one of the sort of conversations that I've had a few different times with some of our, you know, people who are particularly dedicated to advocacy in the environmental realm is how much do we want a, a sort of top-down approach of identifying the areas we need to focus on from an environmental standpoint? Or how much do we need a plan to, or, or you know, regulations or even some ordinances to be flexible to, you know, so we can take community feedback and um, address environmental justice concerns as they arise? You know, taking that community concern into account on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, one thought about how to tackle item three is, you know, starting off with tailoring zoning interventions, neighborhood planning efforts, and other investments for identified EJ areas, including in environmental justice areas of focus, which gives us flexibility if other things pop up in the future or our EJ areas of focus don't get it just right, that we, we still have this as a robust tool to, to look at, um, or as a piece of guidance to identify, uh, identify and address environmental justice concerns. 
Um, the other item was item 13, where we incorporate environmental justice areas of focus into the item about protecting environmentally sensitive areas. And I'm not sure we may, you know, I've always understood environmental justice areas to be uh, areas where environmental injustice has taken place, particularly due because of, you know, the demographics of the people who live there, you know, focusing industrial uses in, you know, areas that are you know, predominantly, uh, you know, pe where pe people of color, color predominantly live. And, you know, I, I think we're getting it two different things from this theme, which is great. You know, there's the environmental justice piece. There's also the sustainability piece. So, you know, I think we should be focusing in this on environmentally sensitive areas, recognizing that some of those areas may not be EJ areas. Yeah, good point. I think two things you just brought up. So the, the EJ areas of focus, I think we can do a better job defining kind of what that's going to be, uh, either in addition to this section or an appendix. Uh, but then going back to what you said, this theme is environmental justice and sustainability. So as we look to kind of highlight areas that um, are having issues from an environmental justice perspective, that's one thing. But there's some er other areas, like you mentioned, uh, either naturalized areas or other, other areas that we need to either protect just um, uh, environmentally. And that's something that we can also just clarify the difference between those two. But I think that makes sense to, uh, to, to do that. Commissioner Hampton, followed by Commissioner Forsyth. Thank you. Um, two questions, and I'm not sure. I think one may be in B, one may be in C. But when item 10 is added regarding monitoring commercial activities or air pollution, is there a similar consideration of monitoring communities that, um, as they grow, that can address stormwater flooding? I think we talk about um, quality and quantity in some cases. And again, I'm. I've said this at other meetings, I'll say it today. You know, there's folks in my neighborhood who are now in a 100-year floodplain that have never historically been there um, as a function of our city growing, which is, I think we all are recognizing the need for that. But how is that being layered in, in terms of, as we're looking ahead to um, potential increases in density? And then second question is, I didn't see anything in here that talked about trying to mitigate um, heat island effect, you're encouraging of tree planting um, in areas, you know, we talk about mature trees and, and the importance of keeping our existing tree canopy, but in areas that don't have that, um, how that might be integrated. No, great question. So I think uh, number four kind of touches on some of what you mentioned uh, re regarding the, the stormwater component um, and then the urban heat island. But I think we can probably elaborate on that. Maybe even we pull it apart and we focus one on uh, kind of the, the stormwater component in terms of like additional development. I think uh, I'm not sure if it's this particular section, but we touch on um, impervious services and how maybe the code reform component of what was, what's happening on the other side of our our team, how they're addressing that. So I think we can elaborate and maybe have its own um, sub bullet or, or bullet or action steps regarding how we want to address, um, actually number five, uh, update development code to reduce the percentage of impervious surface areas. We can elaborate on that section to kind of touch on what you just mentioned uh, regarding um, the, the stormwater as we're looking at uh, more density in the city. So I think four and five can, can speak to that. Uh, with the tree canopy coverage, I, I don't know if we were that specific, but I think that's actually a good connection to, to highlight the tree canopy coverage piece and how that contributes to urban heat island. They're basically, um, they're tied to the hip. So I think we can either add to that number four to include the tree canopy coverage or uh, may, maybe add another item specifically. I'm not sure if we have it's one already. Probably, because <clears throat> number 11 talks about replanting trees um, for for that tree canopy idea, I think it's about elaborating in number 11 because it's not just replanting trees when we're removing them, but areas which have very poor tree canopy today and encouraging planting, not replanting trees in those areas. I think we can do better language on, on number 11 for that, yes. Agreed, and, and I did see that four um, talked about stormwater runoff, but again, it was talking about some of our um, environmental justice goals, which I think it's important that those are highlighted. I think this is 
may be different than right. that. Okay. So okay. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Blair. I want to focus on 11, 12, 13, and 14. That looks like it was written specifically for the Dowdy Ferry Trinity Forest Way. And I want to first start off with saying thank you for number 11, where you want to um, update Article 10 to protect some of those mature trees that are in that area that are like 50, 60, 70 years old that will, we will never be able to see replaced in our lifetimes. Right. Um, and, I, and I like the fact that you're looking at the, the floodplain and the creeks when you, because when you go down the Trinity Forest, the, the Trinity River, um, uh, Trinity Creek, whatever it is, Trinity Creek, because it's forest over there too. I like the fact that you're saying this is what you want to do, but I, but in the support of that, it's it's there. I see there is erosion of that already with um, development, especially when Article Ten does just is not meaty enough to say that how you have to that that you really have to protect that. So is there a way that we can beef this up a little bit that we don't lose our natural forest area? Um, then on number 14, over in that area, we, I, there is a lot of city-owned land. There's a lot of vacant land, that, but it's not... sufficient enough in, in, a, in, a, in one lot here that you may have one or two lots that are sufficient enough that you can do something besides just storage. Is there a way to, to, to identify those plats of land that are down in the eastern section, the southeastern section of the city where we have a lot of land that is still city-owned land that has creeks running through it that needs to be either developed or it needs to be looked at as green belts. Um, I don't know what else to call them, but, but, but green belts, trailways, or, or something of that nature that, that can be identified as protected areas opposed to areas that people just get to do what they want with? Right. Thank no, you. Great, great question. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, to, to speak to your last point first, uh, we're actually working with our parks department because I think a few months ago um, the, the, their parkland dedication um, kind of process, um, we're trying to connect the dots between the areas that they designate as parkland dedication and then some areas within the uh, the city that's owned by the city by, by could be used for uh, contributing to that. So I think uh, we do have a GIS layer that shows all of uh, city-owned properties, and we can we can isolate it to those within these areas. Uh, so we can probably either through uh, follow up with this implementation item identify city-owned properties within those areas that the city could look to add to that um, type of land use or adding to the. Um, the, the urban ag, the green spaces that we have in the city. So we can, we can definitely do that. It's, it's a possibility. Oh, just a follow-up, too. There, we also have a lot of land that's owned by someone that is really should be green belts. Um, and I know that as a city, we don't dictate that y your land is, is, should be green and you can't develop it. What do we do with that? So I think it, the thing is a state policy and, and our attorney might have more kind of feedback in terms of um, just how land use rights uh, in the state, but um, those that are designated are owned privately, uh, we can't, you know, take away certain uses um, in terms of what they've anticipated that used to be. Um, so I think if there are certain areas or certain other parcels that 
could potentially be or be part of that natural uh, landscape that you're thinking about, we can have a, maybe a mo another conversation about looking at the place site map and thinking about what place type should this fall under. Uh, we're still having those conversations and we've, we've actually changed and updated the map to reflect a lot of those kind of analyses, but um, still ongoing. So we can have another kind of map review. Uh, if there are certain areas that you think that we should investigate further, and if the Parks Department is also thinking about uh, if there are certain parts that are privately owned that could kind of fall in with their long-term vision, I think we want to make sure that um, all departments are kind of aligned and those who own the land are, are looking to do that too as well. So that's kind of how we can, could, could approach that. It's more from a conversation piece and looking at the map and having conversations with uh, those who own the land and in our, our Parks Department, what they're wanting to do with um, certain assets in the city. So on uh, number 13, when you, when you says to support the development of environmental justice area focus to protect the environmentally sensitive areas, including the 100 year floodplain, um, I see a lot of development that has that, that, that is in a 100 year floodplain where they, where there are those that um, th through self help, um, <clears throat> change the, the floodplain area so that they can do other things with it. Is there a way that in the plan we can identify those areas that should be even in a floodplain? Because when we change the, those, those when, when it's lifted, we change the flow of water. That's a great point. So I think what we hope to do is well, what was gonna happen is uh, when Fort Dallas is adopted, uh, you'll have the future land use map, and then you can start to overlay the floodplain, the focus areas, and other kind of zoning layers to help provide that, that um, comprehensive view of a particular area. So if somebody comes in for a zoning change or some development within uh, an area that's identified within a focus area, EJ focus areas, floodplain, et cetera, you have more justification to say, well, Fort Dallas is saying we should be uh, trying to protect these areas because of X, Y, and Z. So we'll have those layers uh, for you all in the public to be able to use to, to review some of those cases that do come through that either try to pay more money to you know, do some engineering study to make it work in a floodplain, but for the most part, we can provide a bit more uh, information from a mapping perspective to help you with when you um, either approve or, or don't a particular project in, in those areas. And I think this is going to be my last question in, in regards to this section. I, I was quite qualified that, right? Um, is, there, is there a way that other departments that impact land use, IEBI, um, can look at, can be thought to look at this first before they do anything and before they provide um, the benefits of land use changes that are contrary to the Fort Dallas plan? That's actually another great question. I think we, we talk internally about development review, how that happens in the city. Um, I think different departments look at um, kind of their purview kind of in the silo. Uh, so I think as we're actually looking at other tools where we can review all, well, all departments can review the same project um, at once. So I think, and, and also having a priority or, or sequence of how you review that. So that's also what we're talking about. When a plan comes through, you first look at the guidance and then you delve into the more detailed component. So we're looking to integrate how all departments review um, zoning development cases that would include BI and other departments. And I think you just kind of mentioned, maybe it's something we add to our um, it's not a theme, but maybe just a process improvement process. I mean, problem, problem, process improvement kind of item uh, to this spreadsheet, which is actually 4-4, um, kind of a, just a general process improvement section. So we could add that to, to that section to talk about um, development review, kind of just, just kind of spitballing, could, should kind of focus in, in terms of having all departments review the plan and using this guidance as a first uh, line defense or whatever we want to say to kind of start the, the review of all projects that come through. So we can, we can massage language, but I think that's something we've talked about, but maybe we can kind of clarify 
that process in this in this document. So those that do review cases know to look from four DAOs first and then go to the more detailed uh, guidance as they look through their department lenses. Well, I was, you know, I, I guess we're still, I, we changed to the section and we're back again. So having a last question. GIS seems to be the map, the, the place of choice that all departments go to in order to look for things. Would it be, and I, and I know this is not, this is, it, would it be beneficial to take for Dallas and give it a GIS link in order for any, anyone who's looking could say how, because we, we have a thoroughfare plan that's in GIS now. You have zoning, which is in GIS. You have other things that are in GIS. Can't Fort Dallas be put in GIS as well? 100%, that is the vision. That's actually what my specific team in PUD does is GIS and data analytics. So uh, yes, if I, if the, that's the one thing I do is creating a GIS map that shows our place types to be able to overlay with the other layers you just mentioned. You're welcome. Excellent. Commissioner Forsyth, followed by Commissioner Herbert Hall and Carpenter. My, my first question is, uh, and forgive my ignorance, uh, could you explain what brownfield sites are in number nine, encouraging uh, the design and development of brownfield sites? Thank you. So um, in the development community, sometimes you have what's called a greenfield site, which is it's a horse farm, it's a cornfield, like there's really not a lot there. A brownfield site would be a site where you are redeveloping a former industrial property, uh, that there was a, a warehouse or sometimes a contaminant, um, you know, heavy industrial land use that's out there. We're redeveloping that former um, industrial site. Would you mind expanding this to maybe add that language in there so people know what that is, please? Yes, it's, it's, it's probably a term that we're gonna define in the glossary terms, which I'm, okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I wanna echo, uh, you know, Commissioner Hampton's comments about the uh, need to uh, encourage the planting of new trees, not just uh, replanting of existing uh, or, 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 or trees that have died. Uh, that we need to have that tree canopy coverage expanded within the city, particularly in underserved areas or areas of southern Dallas and communities where there aren't a lot of trees. Uh, you know, that's an equity issue. It's also an issue for, you know, addressing climate change and keeping, the, you know, the, the city cooler. So uh, uh, definitely use more of those uh, terminology in there and, and relate this back to, you know, climate change too. Agreed. Thank you. And then... Uh, under, under number 14, uh, where you have, uh, you know, uh, taking underutilized land or vacant properties for repurposing into environmentally protective land uses, and you have green spaces, urban agriculture, and, or opportunities for urban wildlife protection. Could you add in here parks and trails in community gardens, please? Is that okay. acceptable? We okay. Are y'all okay with that change, adding in parks and trails and community gardens? Because, uh, you know, urban agriculture is a little, really different than community garden. I mean, you know, we, we ought to have more community gardens. I mean, the, you know, those are shared spaces for people to get to know each other and to provide vegetables, uh, fresh vegetables for their communities. I see those as falling in under what's already in there, but if we want to add that language, no, no objection. I think program green spaces include parks and urban ag. Includes yeah, just, I don't see anything in here about our park system, so I, that's why I felt that there should be a reference to our you know, parks and trails in here. I think parks, in my view, parks fall, fall under the heading of urban programmed green spaces, but adding parks is, is no issue. And similarly, urban ag, I think community gardens to be at the small end of urban ag, but right. if we want to add community gardens, I'm not going to. I feel like the bees would support that. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> Do we need pollinator gardens, too? <laughs> it's a good addition. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Herbert, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, great point. Uh, like District 8, 
Um, as mentioned, we have a lot of farmland and agriculture, um, and, and I think we may be the holder of the escarpment in this city. And I know a lot of our commissioners around the table, Horseshoe, may not know what that means, but the protection of the escarpment has come up recently in, in a, a project, and I think it's important. Um, what scares me about Forward Dallas and all the other plans we have, just like the plan to protect the escarpment currently, our developers find ways to loophole them. Um, or go around them uh, or make their way through the escarpment, if that makes sense. Um, we hold a very special place in Texas in holding the escarpment along with Cedar Hill that runs pretty deep into Texas and further, right? So um, I'm glad that there's a mention of that protection in here um, and the bodies of water that leads me to that, right? And the brown fields as well. So Henley Field is in my district. It's a brown field. It's also on a body of water, Mountain Creek Lake. Um, I noticed that Mountain Creek Lake isn't identified in a map, Can you? In, but White Rock Lake is, right? Can you talk about that? Because the community was concerned. So all water bodies uh, should be identified as like an, an additional water body layer on top of the place types. Uh, so typically without that particular layer, it's usually within the um, community, excuse me, the regional open space, but yeah. we're gonna have an additional water body layer on top of that to clearly identify uh, those water bodies there. Thank you. Um, so is, it should, we talked about the development of an environment, just an area of focus. Will we talk about what cleaning up those areas will entail in this project or in an appendix later at all? So that's a good question. Maybe it's really, really we can elaborate upon here. So we can talk about from, from your expertise here in terms of maybe how we, to structure that, we don't have kind of, this can't say this should do this, but it can tell, talk about the next steps in terms of maybe remediation areas. Uh, our map is gonna identify those focus areas, uh, but I think you make, make a good point. Like, okay, so we identified it, we, we know what we wanna do, how do we do it? Uh, so I think we, we'd like to kind of get that feedback. If there's something that we can add to help us with uh, direction toward the how, uh, we can add that, I'm, that's not my, expertise and that's what you want to elaborate yeah, on. Yeah, and just to circle back, um, what language we can add from a land use perspective, because um, there's a lot that would entail cleaning up those brownfield sites that does not have anything to do with land use. You know, we, we say you got to stop this land use, you should go to a different type of land use. Um, and we can lift up and encourage stuff from OEQS, um, but that's probably a little bit more in their realm um, for, for them to dictate how we do that, that cleanup on those sites. Thank you. Um, okay. I think that's important. Not, and you're right, right? We can't say no or not, but we can kind of mention that these brownfield spaces should be cleaned before uh, housing or, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Hall. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, yeah, gentlemen, in item um, 11, you talk about replanting to encourage native planting uh, but higher up, which I think is great. I think we should be doing that. Uh, higher up, we talk about uh, land use planning and redevelopment, such as uh, et cetera, other areas where it does not specifically mention native plantings. And uh, what I'm specifically thinking about here is uh, people who plant, say, Bradford pear trees, which are an invasive species. So I, I would personally encourage the use of that word native to try to get local, you know, strictly local Texas uh, type plantings. Thank you. No, thank you. And just to kind of clarify, like, I guess number seven kind of talks about uh, kind of green open space of adding the native, okay, we, we, can do, we can do that. Mr. Chair, may I ask a point of clarification on that? Please. Um, I think I understand the intent of that, but would it be more appropriate to refer back to, you know, either Article 10 or other, you know, more detailed review that has already been undertaken. And I guess my only concern is, is that if we truly went with native plantings, it's, it can be 
maybe overly restrictive. I, I think what the what I think I hear is we're talking about drought tolerant. We're talking about encouraging you know native species plantings that support our, our wildlife. But I just I know sometimes that can go the other direction. I mean, if we go truly truly native trees, there's I think three. <laughs> and so I just wonder. I, th I think some of the um, you know Phil Irwin has, has maybe taken a look at that through Article 10, this body, and we just want to wonder if that might be another way to to approach that. Yeah, we, we can take a look at that language and perhaps instead of saying that they, you know, they, they should be native plants, they should be drought tolerant resistant plants, such as native plants, but don't have to be. Yeah. Commissioner Carpenter. Yes. One thing I'd like to address is a, a shortcoming I've seen for a number of years in Dallas is that, you know, we spend a lot of time, I mean, Article 10 requires a certain amount of plantings of site trees and street trees. And, you know, we on the CPC spend a lot of time negotiating landscape plans and building inspection to make sure that these uh, plans are followed through. But then everything drops off. There are an alarming number of both private and public developments that include a lot of landscaping where the landscaping dies and nothing is ever done. It seems to me an implementation measure we should consider if we are truly concerned about having a greener city is we need to have some sort of enhanced ongoing monitoring of required landscaping. I know I can point to you know, city um, projects on Sylvan, on Fort Worth Avenue, at Beckley Commerce, on Riverfront at Continental where you know, lovely trees were planted and they've been knocked down, they've died, um, and the areas just don't look good at all. Or there, are, there are many private developments, you know, apartment complexes, convenience stores. The landscaping is lovely for a short period of time and then it's just gone. So I, th I think it does us very little good to require landscaping be planted if we don't have some sort of system to make sure that it stays planted and thrives. I think we can <clears throat> visit with uh, Mr. Irwin and the city attorney's office about do we have those protections in place already in Article 10 and we just don't have a mechanism to enforce them? Or if we don't have those protections in Article 10, is there some type of reinspection that occurs three or two or five years after you know the building permit is finaled that they go out there and they reinspect to ensure that it's compliant with the landscaping plan? I think we can visit with that staff and then come back to see yes, we can put that in here as an implementation item, or it already is, or, or, or just revisit with those folks and come back to you with a better answer. Yeah, I, I, my understanding is theoretically it exists, but I, it may be just a staffing problem, hmm. but which would just be the city deciding that it's yeah. important enough to, to allocate resources that way. We can visit with BI to, to better understand the issue, yeah. But my um, other concern or question is I know we, um, there was recently a, uh, an article on a big map in the Dallas Morning News about the heat island across the city. And one of the things that struck me immediately was, you know, in District 6 anyway, the areas that were most, were the hottest were these large yard industrial areas. And I, th I think it would be worthwhile to look at a development code amendment to require more of those types, if we're going to have those kinds of developments, you no, know, because right now what they have to do is plant a certain number of street trees, and they may they may live, they may not, but the rest of the you know dozens or hundreds of acres can just be structures and paving of various sorts. And if we're going to have environmental justice as a as a major goal, you know, having these types of um, businesses, all this acreage that is uh, devoted to this kind of use that is disproportionately contributing to the heat island effect is not fair to the surrounding community. So anything that we can do to green up, whether we require you know, more tree planting or whether we require a certain dedication of, of, of green space that's, that's truly green space, um, I think that would, would help a great deal in this area. No, I agree. Thank you so much for that one. Mr. Blair, followed by Commissioner Herbert. I think I have the um, most unique area district. I have two landfills, a water treatment plant, and every type of environmental injustice that could be done in, in a city. Um, 
which creates environmental injustices. Uh, I, um, I don't remember I did a seeing on, the only thing I think I remember seeing on the, the map is McComas Landfill, but it doesn't have the mesquite, nor does it, oh, it's, no, it's three. One was changed to a, 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 a golf course. Um, but we find that, the, well, the, the golf course, it's unusable because you can't plant any trees, um, so it's it's a it's a it's green, but it's hot. Um, and, and when you're talking, and then the the, the mesquite landfill is this it's got the same. You can't you can't plant anything that's going to have a deep root, rooting system. Um, and then because it's unstable. You, you, it, it, it moves, you, you can't really say, I'm gonna walk or do a whole lot of stuff on it. So it's still a, unusable. And I find that when I look when I look at those areas in those especially areas for development, in, in, including around the water treatment plant, um, they have been historically um, the place that we put the things that we don't want. So I have areas that look, when you look at the map, it looks like something that's developable. But when you, but, but there is no identification that says you can't develop here because the, the, the land is unusable. Um, or you have places, or you have the communities that have been that that are around there that environmentally just it's just dumping grounds. How do you identify that, and and how do you in the in, in your 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 implementation plan identify changing that from something that's completely a, a, a waste into something that is usable without going through a process to identify. <laughs> Is it something that people can actually live on? Right, no, great question. So kind of few different ways that we've kind of talked through that uh, in the last few years. Some of those areas that either uh, from a land use perspective not being able to be used or owned by the city, identified as regional open space. So basically just kind of keeping that open and naturalized and not um, showing that we're trying to develop a certain type of use here. Um, in certain other areas, like for example, the wastewater treatment facility, uh, that's identified to, to stay uh, that institutional use that the city would, would house to help uh, the growth of the city, and that's also staying the way that it is. So there are certain parts of the city that are, are kind of staying the way that it is because another type of use or redevelopment wouldn't make sense. Uh, so either region open space, if it's owned by the city or some public agency, to kind of keep that land kind of just kind of where it is or if there's a particular use that still makes sense but still doesn't make sense to redevelop something else, the place types have identified that as um, whatever, whatever it's on the map, that's what it's, the vision is for that to be moving forward. But uh, if there, just to make sure I'm kind of speaking to your question, are you thinking about there might be some other areas that aren't region open space, that might not be um, these other uses that you're thinking that should be kind of um, looking forward to another land use? Is that kind of what we're, we're, we're going at with that? Well, well, when I'm talk when I when I look at the if you go over by the water treatment plant, and you look at the land, the water treatment plant is is beautiful. It's uh, it's aesthetically well man it's and, and well managed, but the area around it is not. So how do you, you, you identify that as something that environmentally needs to be assessed before you develop so that 10 years from now you, you, don't, get, you, don't, get, uh, you don't get hit with, oh, you're living on a, on a place that you should not be. And, and basically what I'm trying to ask is how do you identify areas that have been allowed to be um, environmentally unkept 
and then manage to change, and, and is, is, are we going to identify the, what, one, first, are we gonna identify those areas? Two well, is once you, if we are gonna identify those areas, are we gonna identify, is there gonna be a process in place that says that these, these lands, this, this area must be tested before three, you, you decide to develop on it? No, another great question. So what we're looking at with the, the metrics that we're using is for it to be objective. So basically using uh, a layer that shows, you know, the particulate matter in the, in the, in the city or um, land use proximity, overlaying all those objective layers. So it's not just based on what the community says or hears or thinks. We're using data to kind of show why these areas are focus areas. And then in addition to that, uh, the community feedback in terms of the areas that we need to focus on would be added to that component. So what we want to do is kind of use the data layers to kind of just show kind of a first crack. These are the areas based on the data um, that are showing us where we need to focus to based on the feedback from the community um, in terms of what they want to see moving forward if that area or their area is identified as an area of focus and they have mentioned that they want to move that land use to something else, that helps you all when you, when you get a proposal in that area that's in an area of focus that has a different lane use from what's on the ground to continue moving the, the needle forward with changing that lane use. So for example, again, going back to um, the wastewater treatment facility in your district, what we've heard in the peripheries that like you just said, it's a great facility, like for what it does, everybody's really appreciative of what's happening around there. Um, you might be speaking also what's happening on the southern part of that facility, which is outside city bounds, um, but within where just north of the, the facility, it's more rural, it's the small town residential, and the community members have provided us feedback that they wanna keep that rural nature intact, and that's the kind of development that they'd like to see moving forward. So going to, back to what you said, um, this um, implementation section is gonna add those metrics, uh, me metric layers, but it's gonna be that plus the vision and your feedback to see what happens next. Uh, when a case comes through or some development proposal comes through to, to see if it matches what the data and the community is saying um, based on the feedback that we have here. Commissioner Herbert. Sorry, I took a nap. Um, uh, two things. One, one I'm going to match um, Commissioner Blair's um, wastewater treatment plant with a power turbine plant, power plant in the Southwest transfer station and other environmental injustices, again, in the Southern sector of town. So the environmental justice piece of this is very important. Um, to piggyback on um, our wastewater um, in, in development, I think it was number seven. Um, we talk about this a lot in our cases and I know it's, a, it's an issue with development services, but our retention and detention ponds and the tension to how they're a landscape I think is important um, and the drainage involved with it. I know it's a, it's like I said, it's a development code and neighborhood plan and, and some other things, but if there's anything we can draw in this plan um, around that um, specific area, um, in my district and other districts neighboring mine, these detention and retention ponds have become dumping sites and mosquito, um, hawk, mosquito ponds basically, um, a beds. So uh, finding ways to protect us in this regard would be would be helpful. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, our team actually before even before Dallas started, we actually were looking we were reviewing zoning cases from an urban design perspective. Uh, just those who are urban designers, uh, we discussed that retention and detention ponds probably need a updated uh, either design standards, even though it's outside of our purview. Uh, so we can mention that there needs to be a discussion to rethink or re uh, kind of think about how code or whatever guidance is kind of guiding how those look like uh, should be investigated. We began the conversation before Fort Dallas. I think that can be something that we highlight here, but that's a good point because some of those, uh, the way that it's developed just doesn't look good. So I think we wanna make sure that the design of those uh, utilitarian errors can also be something that could be in integrated to, to enhance some of the other uh, assets that you have in your district and throughout the city, that makes sense. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions, commissioners, on this slide before we keep going? Okay, I'll 
just, I guess, finish out this piece by uh, where we began with Commissioner Blair thanking you gentlemen and, and staff and club. Uh, on this particular piece, I think, unfortunately, it's getting overshadowed by the housing piece, but this is really monumental work. So I, I thank you, all of you, for, uh, for this work. No, thank you so much. All right, so our next um, table to review, it's a little smaller, is our transit oriented development and connectivity implementation table. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, this theme is not just looking at transit oriented development, but how are we uh, making sure that our communities are connected uh, through other um, transportation means, walkability, et cetera. So uh, any comments you have specific to this, we can elaborate on. And I also want to mention that if we don't get to discuss um, this in our kind of updates section of the plan. Uh, we are also trying to emphasize how TOD gets incorporated into each of the place types. So um, as we think about what does TOD look like in a residential community, what does TOD look like in a mixed use community, we want to start to break those down depending on the types, the place types or the different types of places that exist because a TOD in uh, your district is going to look different from somebody else's district. So we want to make sure we're breaking down how those TOD uh, gets applied uh, depending on where you are in the city and which type of place types are the predominant use there. So just want to FYI that as we begin our conversation. Commissioner Forsyth, followed by Commissioner Hampton. Okay. Um, your goal here at the top says advanced, safe, compact, and walkable mixed-use development. And so I, I guess my, my, my thought is, our question is, uh, would it be helpful to include a point here uh, to actually encourage the, the development of uh, uh, infrastructure for walkability? Uh, you know, sidewalks, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian bridges, those kind of things. Seems like to me that Commissioner Forsyth, please. Commissioner, please make sure you talk into the microphone. Some folks online may oh, not be able to hear me. you. Forgive me, I am so You're sorry. Fine. <laughs> I am learning. So I guess just to repeat what you mentioned. So as we're looking at the theme of this, um, this theme, um, the, the, the goal, excuse me, of this theme is to advance, you know, safety, compactness, walkability. You just mentioned that should this, should we start to add more language that looks at the, the infrastructure side of things in terms of how, how do, how do we, uh, think about uh, infrastructure, sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, I think we can elaborate upon that. I think Pedestrian maybe bridges. in section yeah. B yeah. Could, could maybe elaborate upon that with the action item, but I think you, you're kind of touching on kind of the next step, is which is what we want this to be is, okay, the, the action steps, how do we do that? And what are the partners that will help us do that? So I think a lot of these leads here, uh, we have PUD, but I think our transportation department, they're definitely gonna be a, a huge partner in that, and we can add some of that language to think about um, how we do that. I don't have anything top of mind, but I think it makes sense to kind of bring that infrastructure component to this and how we either prioritize focus um, investment to make that happen. Yeah, I think um, some of this language might be written by a transportation planner um, because some of it gets a little wonky where sometimes we just need to say well, we need to build better sidewalks, more sidewalks um, in an equitable manner. And I think that just that statement can be included as an action item and then we can work with um, transportation to figure out who takes the lead on that, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think one of the things I'm struggling with, and so I'm hoping you can give me some context, is that this is um, referenced as a transient development and connectivity, but it doesn't speak, I don't think, more broadly, or I'm, I'm missing it, which is entirely possible. If it's somewhere else, let me know. Uh, transportation. And so I'm thinking of things like where we have, you know, I-30 that's about to go, un, you know, undergo substantial redevelopment. You know, there's ongoing discussions regarding 345. I can think of the deck park in uh, Commissioner Chernox. You know, how are we talking about those types of projects and their related development and their opportunities to support a lot of the other items that we're talking about here that I just, I didn't see necessarily um, covered. And I don't know if that's a new item or how that is being thought about. I believe some of the action items are written in a manner in which 
provide some guidance about what from a land use and urban design perspective you could do with transportation around those larger freeways but it doesn't specifically say what you know, what should happen with those freeways Is that and, and, and I again I guess I'm I'm trying to put this because I know we've got the map and then the map and it may be that and I know I've mentioned this for this idea of corridors and that's clearly a macro corridor um, but so that was one kind of global question and then you know similar to Commissioner Forsyth I was trying to think about how how we're talking about the use of our public right-of-ways and our street and I know you've mentioned the complete street manuals in here but how new development and, and maybe strengthening the, the link between those two um, items and then I've got I'm, only because I've got to attend to talk about it, but when we talk about the inland port, you know, one of the things that was highlighted in, in hearing others talk about it is, we've heard Commissioner Blair mention, where there's, you know, a lack of transportation and, and how, and I, I know there's some language here, but it just seems like we need to maybe expand on some of that. So three kind of big items. Right, yeah, so with the, the corridor conversation or, or comment, uh, number six, I want to just point attention to that. So we're actually talking with our transportation department uh, as we are incorporating the complete streets, um, the type, the place types and their composition or adjacency, excuse me, to the complete streets. There might be a few complete streets that need to either get updated based on the place types that are um, near particular complete streets. So we're having conversations with uh, the transportation department in terms of what those street typologies would have to, which, which corridors might need to change. Um, and they mentioned that from that kind of exercise, that would also inform an update to the thoroughfare and freight master plan to be able to align the land uses with what they're going to be doing with a future update on that side. So maybe we can re refine or tweak number six to be clearer with that. But the idea is the place types and the vision from a future land use perspective um, and the complete streets, there might be some, some miss. Um, misalignment that we need to identify, and that's going to also help with updating that document and also a future thoroughfare uh, freight plan uh, update post for Dallas. Um, I'm not sure that it touches on the first. Well, it, well, I guess part of what I saw is that I was anticipating, you know, the public waterway utilization was sort of captured in, in that component in, in item six. and. I'll try to get some more thought and see if I can get more specificity on the language on that one. Yeah, and, and number eight is a broader statement. <laughs> I was going to ask if, if we're going to include the definition of the 15 minute yes. communities within our glossary. So we can, um, but number eight um, does provide a little bit of catch all for a number of things that have been brought up. Um, and if we need to get further into some of those details, um, you know, we are open to having the that language be proposed. Right, and I think I, I can elaborate a bit on that too. So as we go throughout the communities and what we hear is that, you know, I wanna be able to do everything that uh, either this district or this district does in my area. So starting to identify or, or define is gonna be what happens post for Dallas. It's starting to define what makes up a complete community. Um, what was that boundary? What are those uses within uh, that community, that's going to be something that we need to build upon and define further, but generally that speaks to being able to access your services, being able to get all you need to get through through a 15 minute, I think it's a drive from where you are, or 15 minute walk, excuse me, from where you are, um, and then being able, excuse me, <laughs> to, to be able to make sure that each community is its own kind of entity, but we haven't kind of delved to defining that within the city bounds. Uh, that would be something that we would need to kind of develop post for Dallas. I appreciate that wake up by saying drive instead of walk. We all we all perked up on that one. Um, and so just one other thing is, as we're talking about, you know, other opportunities, you know, thinking about it, it's speaking a little bit to what Commissioner Carpenter was speaking of, where we've got existing commercial, new commercial areas that might be able to help support interconnectivity. They're large areas. Again, as they're redeveloped, as there's other opportunities to create linkages to add some of our green infrastructure components, um, it just seems like it might be a piece of the puzzle. Um, and again, not trying to put things that you know don't need to be together together, but where there are opportunities um, to strengthen those connections. Just it seems like some acknowledgement that there may be, you know, atypical opportunities that are out there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agreed. Thank you, Commissioner Kingston. 
So this is part of the plan that I hear a lot of um, folks who are advocating for don't even think about touching single family neighborhoods or anything around them um, point to and say, look, you haven't put any work into the TOD part of this plan and gee, how simple it would be if we just put all of the housing we need in and around TOD nodes or greenfields in southern Dallas. <clears throat> and I think part of what, and, and to be clear, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I think there's a lot of problems with those arguments and I don't think they're um, necessarily always made in good faith. But um, I think part of what allows people to point to that and say that is that there's not a lot of specificity in this part of the plan. And I think that it also talks over a lot of people's heads. There's a lot of terminology in the way that it's structured that is not very easy for most uh, members of the public to really read and understand. And so I think in the next version of this, it would be very helpful to have um, more detail and, and think about the language you're using and the way that things are said in a way that you know, if you're trying to explain this to your neighbor or your grandmother, would they understand it if they read it? That would help. And, and also, you know, as you think through how you use illustrations in the plan, are there illustrations you could tie it to, you know, as you have discussions, this is what exactly what we're talking about. Because I think about, you know, the, the zoning case we had on the Hill being a good example of this type of development and while I think that's a great development and will provide a lot of housing and provides the type of, of um, opportunities we're talking about, it certainly isn't going to solve all of the problems and it certainly isn't going to, to create all of the housing types that the people want. It provides certain types of things but not other things and that's true for a lot of what we're talking about and so those are some Think that's some feedback I would offer is the other thing is, you know, as we talk about missing middle and as we talk about those type of housing opportunities that people are looking for, how do you fit that into these type of locations and developments? And those might be more appropriate on, you know, thoroughfare plan or um, those type of access points or as Commissioner Hampton was talking about, um, you know, the Gateway or Bering I-30 or some of those places as opposed to at a dart stop. But I think those type of details need to be fleshed out better in this part of the plan in order for people to really understand what you're thinking right. and how it fits in with the overall um, comp plan. Thank you. No, 100%, thank you. Just to kind of jump on, on that bit. So I think the um, update of this plan is to do just that, provide some graphics in terms of how each of the different TOD typologies look like uh, in the community. So when people see that visually, uh, there might be a misconception of TOD just being applied to your community, but when you break down the different types of TODs and show graphically what that means, uh, I think that can provide just better assurances um, when, when we update the plan, so great point. Commissioner Herbert. Um, to, to a couple different points on um, I agree with Commissioner Kingston. I'm working on a TOD currently at Westmoreland Station that's overdue um, for one, and there's a lot of empty space that has been acquired by the city of Dallas along with DART, and they've converged on this, this plan. Um, and the plan includes retail, um, apartments, and even a little spot that may become a daycare, right? So having that language in here could help the community um, better understand what we would like TODs to look like. Um, a lot of people came in the room thinking Mockingbird Station, which was too expansive for them. Um, so the typologies, I think, would be helpful. Um, I think another thing we spoke of about, and I wrote it down, but I didn't write it down fully. Oh, how the TODs are affecting um, what comes to it and how it looks. I think you spoke of it in economic development a little bit about how these TODs will incentivize the areas that they're in. Um, and some other areas like that. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that, but that's it, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sleeper. I wanna bring up something that 
may be a landmine you don't want to walk into, but um, uh, the city of Dallas has uh, in the past um, allowed uh, firms to go in and, and install um, advertising kiosks in the public right of way, which tend to uh, uh, be a very negative um, factor in terms of walkability. Basically, they they clog up the right of way for the sake of advertising. And uh, there's a current proposal floating around City Hall to do that same thing again, but this time with uh, digital kiosks that have uh, lighted, changing advertising messages. Most of the property owners in the, in the walkable communities in the transit oriented development areas, um, to say they don't like them would be an understatement. They, they pretty much detest these things, and yet the plan is to install new ones is marching forward. I wonder if that's not something that ought to be addressed in your um, in your draft about how the the city goes forward. Thank you. Second that. No, that's that's a great comment, and just to maybe jump on what you're what you're hearing from your community. Uh, in addition to maybe just how it looks like in the public right of way, um, are you getting feedback in terms of it just being in the way? What, what other? I'm trying to think of what other things that you're hearing from the community that maybe we can add uh, as an action step to to elaborate upon. Um, I'm not sure. Is, is it look. just that similar to housing? Because there are some great kiosks in, in France that they've they've done, but the ones in Dallas perhaps aren't context sensitive to those TOD or those urban areas, that it doesn't blend in well with those areas, that it's just in the middle of the sidewalk and it, it, it makes it difficult to walk in those areas. Um, I think we can talk about perhaps having better design guidelines for those um, in Dallas. Well, if, if I could just add to that, the um, uh, in addition to the property owners in those areas not liking them, the retailers, and it's very hard to get uh, urban retail to work, um, but in those areas where there is urban retail, they absolutely detest those things being out in front of their stores. And yet, um, the the planning aspect of that, uh, from what I can tell, has, has been overlooked, and I can't think of a better place for that to be addressed than in a document like the one you're producing. And we can talk with our signs team because I, th I think uh, so I'm not sure y'all are familiar with Jason Poole and uh, he's familiar with that. So we're going to have a conversation, I think, just to elaborate on what you just said and kind of see what can we do in this and hopefully propose a, a recommendation when we come before you all again. Commissioner Forsyth. I wanted to ask this question earlier, but I struggled with how to frame the question. I was hoping maybe someone else would ask it, but uh, I'll go ahead and ask it. On, on, on item number two, uh, you state right size and reduce parking regulations within parking code amendments to allow increased development opportunities for TOD projects. Uh, what is the implications of this? Are, are we stating in Fort Dallas that we, we uh, agree with the policy of getting rid of parking minimums in, in our code? Um, I, I would say it's taking a look specifically at the TOD site. So Mockingbird Station was brought up earlier. So if you live at Mockingbird Station right next to the train and let's say you're working downtown, perhaps looking at that and saying, do you need one and a quarter parking spaces if you're living at, if we're doing a development at Mockingbird Station versus if you're doing a development that is not at Mockingbird Station. Um, a, a, a development maybe at Westmoreland Station or at Elam, again, it's right-sizing those parking regulations to say, does this provide you the transit network to get to different places in Dallas, your job and places you want to go, without having the need for all of that parking? And also just to add to that, so uh, the development of these tables aren't just done in a silo. Um, so our transportation department, DART, uh, they have either policy on the ground now that says this, and they wanted us to either emphasize within TODs, we do need to look through our parking regulations and how do we right size, what is that proper uh, ratio? We, know we don't have the number, but I think they want us to 
continue that policy direction that have been adopted already within this plan. So as we look to investigate what parking regulations look like in the city, that it's being kind of reiterated through just different lenses, land use, connectivity, et cetera. Uh, so this is one of those that actually suggested that we include and think about how do we partner to make it work in the city. Commissioner Hampton. Well, just one follow-up as we're talking about some of this. You know, I think when I was mentioning, um, you know, how the public right-of-way is utilized, and again, I think I heard you mention layering in graphics, layering in additional information here. I think we've got a lot of that maybe defined in some of our other tools that are mentioned here in giving just more clarity to those. And I will say as I'm looking around, I actually went back to our um, 2006 current for Dallas. I mean, it's a 22 page document on transportation. And a lot of it is, it's section diagrams and it's talking about what we want in our transportation network to look like. And again, I think we've adopted and probably even advanced further a lot of those. But I think some of that information would just really help give some clarity to, to some of the things we're talking about. And, not blocking our public right of way with kiosks that many of us have had to navigate around <laughs> when we um, traverse our city. Um, there's also a great diagram that I'm sure you guys have and, and you know many of the planners are aware of that talks about what a 15 minute city is and how that relates not just to transit oriented development to overall how we traverse our city. And so I, um, again, I don't know exactly where this is going to go. I look forward to seeing it, but just wanted to give a little bit of extra context if that helps you all as you're looking at the updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All great comments. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else here before we keep going? All right. All right. Next section, uh, housing choice and access. Uh, so again, just to overview the objectives in this one, uh, A, provide a a mix of housing types and affordabilities across all neighborhoods to meet, uh, di to meet diverse needs, prioritize housing investments for most vulnerable populations, especially the out house and those at high risk of displacement in a line lane Gentlemen, use policy. Oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're kind of discussing, this is probably a, a meaty piece of the, the discussion here. And since we only have 16 minutes left, I don't, oh, okay. and, and I want to respect the time of the, the commissioners. Uh, so maybe we, we table this to one of our lunch and right, you know, CPC. Okay. Yeah. We, we can do that. We'll so we can, the, we can pause this one and yeah. we can go to the. In fact, for this, we can uh, do a, a, a morning briefing right. and we'll push some of the zoning brief, you know, okay. a little bit further back. So, because I want to allow full time for this one. Okay. If you don't uh, mind. And let me know if you want to uh, pause the housing and the other sections or just the housing one. We can, we can do that. Let me know what you were thinking. Yes, the, just okay. the housing piece. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, so we'll pause conversation on this one. Uh, we'll move this to our next briefing item uh, to focus our discussion on, and we can touch base on the eco dev and the urban design uh, before we, we end today's meeting. So next up, we'll be uh, covering the eco dev and revitalization implementation table. Uh, one note, as we look uh, to objective D, uh, that is remove land use and zoning barriers that hinder small business development. Uh, that was uh, an added suggestion from CLUP uh, when they added that um, item. Um, no action steps were uh, proposed during that discussion. So uh, if you all have any suggestions regarding that particular action item, we can talk about that today or after this meeting. Uh, and we can start, try to include that in the next update of the plan document. So in terms of the focus for this one, um, D would be helpful for our team to, to build upon. Uh, but if there's any other discussions with any other items, we can, we can touch on that too. Commissioner Forsythe. Okay, on the uh, item number two, uh, facilitate collaborative placemaking initiatives to reimagine the adaptive reuse of historically and culturally significant structures. I just want to emphasize here that the goal is to protect these structures, right? Right, okay. And, and then uh, number six, um, would you uh, consider adding here um, uh, on your items, you have uh, ensure adequate public facilities, housing, and mobility options for existing and future businesses and their employees 
I, I, I presume also in residential areas as well, but I was thinking si sidewalks should be included here too, because that, that is an issue in our communities in Southern Dallas, is a lot of these communities don't have sidewalks. So I think uh, just it is a general uh, comment when we talk about either public facilities or mobility options, uh, we can such as, we can do such as sidewalks, we can, we can do something like that to clarify that. And um, on number nine, uh, create and implement anti-displacement policies. Uh, you know, the questions that I've heard from people is, what do you mean, what are these uh, policies? You know, there, to me, this could be em em embellished a little bit on, on this statement here. What so, are your strategies? So, um, as a land use document and as a planning department, there is difficult to create those displacement policy, sorry, anti-displacement policies. Um, those are usually housed out of housing or economic development. Um, and I know housing is currently working with um, an outside party to understand what are the different types of anti-displacement tools they have, whether it's relocation, whether it's uh, property tax, uh, you know, um, not abatement, but they buy down the property taxes. There are different policies that housing is working on. And I know at CLEP it was brought up that as different areas, as more investment goes to certain areas, you have small businesses that also may be displaced, um, in particular um, ones that might be culturally or historically significant. Um, and we don't have those tools identified, um, but this is to, to make the statement that we should, begin, we should start to identify what tools we should do to, to, to create those anti-displacement tools, but we just don't have them identified. I think just to add, so the city has several tools to kind of help with that, uh, but there isn't a, a unified policy in terms of how those tools work together uh, to, to address gentrification and, and displacement. So uh, we're, we are working with a few um, kind of vendors and organizations to develop that right now. I think um, Builders of Hope is working with the housing department to develop some of, uh, develop a policy for the city. Uh, so again, that's outside the purview of land use, but I think being able to coordinate uh, what does land use, what can it do, what should it do uh, as they're developing those tools, we should be you know, part of that conversation. And this item just mentions that you know, as that continues to get, to get developed, um, our department, small business, the small business center, et cetera, should be part of that conversation to make sure that that particular policy, uh, whatever that looks like, incorporates uh, land use and other aspects uh, from the city. Vice Chair Rubin. So on D, um, I know it's a, uh, something that's it's very much in discussion on the code so side too and we have a code amendment coming to us on it, but what I hear again and again is that um, some folks trying to open new businesses, you know, and particularly in historic buildings that are, you know, weren't built for today with, you know, for the auto-oriented city is they're having trouble opening up because of our parking requirements. So not saying that we need to make one recommendation or another here on how we particularly address the parking issue, but I think our parking minimums are a barrier towards small business development. You know, it, seem, and it seems like even though there are a variety of perspectives um, on how we do parking reform, everyone, almost everyone seems to agree that our 1960s based parking code is a barrier towards business development. I think that's a great point. And we can probably use some of the language that we had in our TOD connectivity component that kind of touches on on that a bit and kind of direct that more toward uh, kind of how that could be of hindrance to small businesses. But that's a, that's a great suggestion to, to add to the action step. Commissioner Herbert, please. Really quick. Um, took me off my original point. Um, work, uh, we have work, live works in my neighborhood. Um, so a small business owner wants to come in, buy one of these. Um, the parking rules are kind of similar to residential in that situation. My, I'm, I'm guessing, I think, yeah, okay. Um, and second, if I was implementing this after it passes as a council member or leader of the community, would it be important to, in my mind is how I'm seeing this, should I create or have created uh, groups on these five sections? 
groups of individuals in the community to build out with uh, uh, start working these five seconds the implementation plan component um, you, you could you could have uh, somebody who's specific to economic development who's specific to transportation that, that could make sense aligning people's uh, uh, f expertise to those that, that'd be something to do um, our team can also help connect the dots too because we speak with um, those experts so I think that, that could make sense in terms of your community Focusing on that, what we want to do is make sure that all these themes tie to land use, and then those that are experts in those areas, they can kind of elaborate up upon it. So that, that'd be a good suggestion, but we can also help to either connect the dots to land use if needed, or connect you to those specific expertise if that's desired. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hamp, then followed by Commissioner Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I think I echo Commissioner Rubin's thoughts on parking regarding historic structures. I can't think of any case where um, there has not been broad community support and support around this horseshoe from the idea of, you know, preserving our existing building and housing stock, you know, or in, and I, I said housing, but I truly do mean holistically our existing building stock. And I think, um, Item two speaks to that as well about the adaptive reuse and that there needs to be considerations given to that. Um, I was also trying to understand when we're talking about, um, and I think this falls in nine a little bit, coordinating with city departments to create and implement anti-displacement policies for both our small businesses and our homeowners. But as we're, and again, this is gonna be a toggle, I think, between the housing component and this component, you know, how we think about fostering home ownership, how we think about, um, and I, this is something that's likely not allowed by state law, but I'll ask the question, you know, rent stabilization, all the other components that speak to supporting our residents, supporting um, businesses also generally, I think others can speak, um, you know, more, better than I am able to, um, but also how do we think about housing reinvestment? I know we've got some tools in place, but do we need to expand any of that to, you know, a, as we're trying to look at solving a lot of things with this document, you know, those are just three items that I didn't necessarily, I, I think we start to touch on them, and I guess I'm just wondering if they need to be strengthened. And a couple places in here we um, reference corridor planning efforts and corridors that are identified through Forward Dallas, I will confess I'm trying to do a word search now because I don't remember seeing those earlier in the document. And so I'm just, you know, as we're identifying this as the opportunities, do we have the language back on the front end that we need to help support this implementation tool? Yeah, I think, I think the housing discussion, just to avoid it kind of spilling out to uh, more conversation, I think we can we, we answer that. I think uh, next briefing, um, definitely 100% we will answer that question. Uh, going to the uh, corridor component, that goes back to the, our discussion about um, the, the focus areas. So each theme is going to have a, a map or some kind of analysis that shows focus areas per the themes. And this one's going to show uh, focuses on corridors and TOD areas to kind of help identify. So that's uh, in the appendix and the map? Uh, either appendix or part of this document. So okay. I think we're talking through with, um, with, with our consultant, the work that they're doing, and also just through just uh, this body, I think it, it can go either way, but that's going to be something that we uh, think about the best tie-in to what this is saying in terms of um, language and then also how the map is identifying those areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner Carpenter, followed by Commissioner Rubin. Yes, um, I'm having trouble with item number 10, which says ensure appropriate land use and zoning in designated areas to support emerging creative and technology industries to supplement the expansion of logistics related jobs and targeted industry clusters, particularly in the southern sector. You know, when I break this down, it's talking about ensuring land use and zoning to support industry. Well, if you have industrial zoning, you're allowed to do emerging, creative, whatever. Are we really talking about trying to clean up existing industrial areas by incentivizing cleaner, greener, industry and I mean why is the focus on the southern sector I mean if if we want clean green creative tech industry why would that not be across the city so I mean can you kind of clarify yeah, what, the, what what the thinking is behind this no, 100 percent this might be a, 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 a dual uh, answer so from what we've heard is that you know the prevalence of industrial uses in the southern sector uh, how can we think about 
um, a mix of other uses that can either support uh, what's on the ground or think about if we're trying to transition to another uh, type of industry or industries, uh, what should that look like? So it's kind of, most, I guess, we're plainly speaking, thinking about mix of uses in these areas that have been predominantly focused on one industry. How can we allow the land use to support that uh, kind of innovation in where uh, these industries are going, where they're looking at not just keeping um, the, the, the envelope, but thinking about what happens inside in the mix of uses. So just thinking about the mix of uses in these areas to help foster that innovative approach um, in terms of what the, what the industry is looking like uh, in those targeted uh, industries, excuse me. So more mix of uses in these areas. How can we emphasize and support a more uh, more a broader mix of uses in those areas to allow uh, more things to happen. Okay, I'll give some thought to better wording. Thank you. Take us home, Commissioner Rubin. One other thought, Commissioner Herbert brings up um, live work, and perhaps it's also time to consider, you know, how our um, accessory uses work in the code and in residential areas and how they allow and don't allow home-based businesses. I don't have anything more concrete than that, but I think in 2024, particularly you know, post-pandemic, as, as the workplace shifts, we may want to take a fresh look at that without any specific recommendations. Yeah, we can visit with code compliance to see if they're getting additional issues with home occupations to see since 2020 if so many more people are now working remotely and at the house. Um, are there things that we may need to consider for uh, to put in here to research for um, our code amendment? Yeah. One last question on the section, commissioners. Oh. Okay. All right. So what we'll do is table the urban design and the housing. We we could do that in a minute. We can we, we can knock this out pretty quickly if y'all want to. Yeah. But no, <laughs> no, we, we, no. Yeah, we can't do this. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna wrap put those two together, I think, um, in our next briefing. But what I want to touch on is just uh, you all have on on your desks a uh, schedule for the next um, few events for Fort Dallas. Uh, so May second next week, uh, next actually two weeks from now, we'll have a follow up discussion regarding this implementation table. Uh, but next Thursday, that's when we have our public comments. Um, so as we look at the schedule, uh, looking through the public comment periods, um, if you all think we need to add or think through adding another specially called meeting, uh, we can. I think the feedback that we've gotten so far, we'll be able to have a, a draft document uh, published by the end of the month that incorporates all your feedback. And I think that will be good for the community to have as public comments begin, uh, especially as public comments continue into May. So our team, in terms of what we're doing, we're kind of on schedule to have something uh, updated for the end of the month. But if you all feel we need another specially called meeting between now and the ne next few months, uh, we can talk through when that could or should be uh, just to make sure we're getting your comments um, in the public forum. So um, if there's any thoughts on that, we can talk about that briefly. Uh, if not, um, that's the last thing we can t we can uh, kind of end our conversation on. I'm going to actually mm -hmm. jump to this slide and the other components, the other slides I have on on the document. I mean, on the presentation, we'll touch on next meeting. We do have a couple of questions on that, Commissioner Forsythe. Yes, could you explain exactly how the public comments uh, session will be held? Will it be here? Will uh, citizens? Yes. So I believe they're both going to be. Uh, uh, in council chambers that I think there, there was some kind of uh, scheduling kind of um, coordination happening. They should both be here uh, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, both times certain meetings, nothing happening beforehand, just basically opening up the conversation for the community to provide feedback on the plan draft so far. Um, and by the time we get to May, there will be another version of the plan document. So by the time we get to the May public comments, they'll be able to provide their comments on that too as well. So uh, the public will have to register in advance in order to be able to speak at that session, or will just anyone at the session be able to speak? So I guess you want to speak on the... Yes, it, 
anyone that uh, that comes to the session can speak. Only the folks that that want to speak online have to register beforehand. Okay. And then in terms of logistics, what we'll do is, uh, since we're going to uh, budget three hours for the session, depending on how many people show up is when we'll know how many minutes they will get, right? Uh, we will start out with, with three minutes unless we get that, you know, we get 500 people show up and then we'll have to just cut that back. Uh, so unfortunately, we, we just won't know. We won't know until that evening uh, how much time each speaker will get. Uh, I hope it's three minutes. But it may not be. We may not have enough time for to let everyone speak three minutes. I, I know, based on my experience speaking to the uh, council and the commission, you know, with the short-term rental debate, we always had to prepare, prepare one-minute, two-minute, and three-minute versions of our remarks. It's so, so it's awful. I know. It's. But. I, I would suggest that you just make it two minutes and just try to keep to that. I mean, you know, I think two minutes is sufficient. You know, yeah, I, I would anticipate everyone should plan on a minute, and if we're able to give them more, yeah, I, right. it's always the wisest thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think three minutes is holding out too much hope for folks. yes. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> um, so they, uh, if they show up here, they will be able to speak. Absolutely, and they don't have to register. Correct. Okay. Yep. Only the folks online will have to pre-register. Uh, Commissioner Hall. Yeah, for some reason I had on my calendar we had a public comments tonight. Is that's that's not right? Okay. No, it's not. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. You have a rare night off, Commissioner Hall. It's web public or, or via WebEx, right? Yes, it's going to be both. So in person and through WebEx. And uh, as uh, Chair mentioned that those who register virtually will need, uh, those who tune in virtually and want to speak would need to register to do that. Got it. Thank you. Please, of course. Okay, just, just for the record, I want to make sure I got, have this correct. Um, so April 18th, we'll be meeting in room 60 South, briefing room, uh, from six to nine. And it would be a public comment only. Oh, you said that is 6 ES, is it wouldn't be in the chambers? 6 E South. 6 E South, that's right that's, above us. That's a good clarification. Okay. Yes. Mm -mm. This is not available. Gotcha. Council Chambers is not available. Okay. Um, May 9th, uh, we will meet in the Council Chambers. Um, public comment from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Correct. Did we add anything else to any of this? This body did not. Okay. No. And I, I apologize, but I really did try to get this council chambers, but I'm sorry. No, we weren't bumped. Uh, we, they have, at the beginning of the year, we turn in our dates and that's it. And everybody else can, you know, grab a date. But my understanding is that there, there are um, ad hoc meetings and council committee meetings and all that that take place in here when we're not in here so we're lucky we had we got it today i was surprised that we got it for today and so also for may, may 9th we're good for may 9th so so we uh, were may 9th you say we are in here may 9th yes sir okay and what's the capacity in the briefing room oh, yeah. so we're we if we're in the council briefing room which is what it is. We're not able to get in here, so no use dwelling on that. I know sometimes we have had officers or, or you know, fire folks come and say we're above capacity, and I imagine we will hit numbers that, that fill that room. If we could have, I guess, DPD or someone else there sort of maybe queuing people up and, and acknowledging from the outset that we're not going to be able to have everyone in that room at one time, I think that would be a, a good way to deal with it rather than having to deal with that big meet, mid meeting. Yeah, and we'll we'll so have the Mr. flag Chair, room available. If I may, is it or is it possible to also maybe either have the flag room or have somewhere else where folks can watch the proceedings if they're here so that they feel like they can understand what the discussion and what the other comments are, are coming to us? I've not requested. I'm not quite sure if the flag room is available, but I can I can go ahead and request the flag room for us on that date for the, six, uh, the 18th. Yeah, I think it's just where we know we're going to be space limited because I would, similar to others, anticipate we'll have a pretty large turnout. 
Thank you. Negotiations are open, Commissioner Kingston. We'll see if we can, uh, and in fact, you know, we had our bond, some of our bond meetings up in the flag room, and it seems like it's it's got a bigger capacity than the room upstairs. We could probably hold more people there. Yeah, and I can speak. If you could, I mean, if you could work hey, out, we could. Right. Okay. So mm. I'm not even sure that the flag room is available. Gotcha. Right. Okay. That's why we're not in here. There's going to be a meeting. Right. Mm. And I can There's speak from um, work with uh, building, ser uh, building services and the, the uh, reservation teams. When there is a meeting here, they usually try to either reserve that flag room with this room just because noise attenuation and other aspects and how people go in and out. So I think if we look at you know, what's happening through other parts of the of City Hall. There might be some other ancillary rooms that could support, but typically when this is reserved, we can't reserve the flag room because of that. Commissioner Crawford. Uh, is the room on L1 available that day? Uh-huh, because it's bigger. It is bigger, Commissioner, but I think the problem is because it would be WebEx, it's really difficult to have the screen to show all 15 okay. of y'all. Thank you. And it's very difficult at this point at the stage uh, that we're in to try and move things around we will figure it we'll figure it out uh, commissioners thank you for your time we'll see you next uh, Thursday in the evening it's 2 8 p.m. enjoy the rest of your day thank you everybody thank you all